June 27th, 2022 meeting of the Board of Selectmen. Please stand for a Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Are there any public announcements, Alex Haggerty? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have two quick public announcements. Okay. Residents of Abington, stay up to date with all the happenings and important information related to the town. Abington has launched our new communications platform, Code Red. The system will be the official voice of Town Hall and used to send community updates, upcoming events, and critical communications. Expect alert, uh, excuse me, ex expect alerts regarding road closures, storms, closings, and emergency alerts. Please sign up to stay informed by phone calls to landlines and cell phones and text messages and emails. The link to sign up for Code Red is available on the Town of Abington's Facebook page, uh, and it's also on my Alex Haggerty uh, Selectman page as well, and I know my other board me members' Facebook pages as well, too. Um, there is English, Portuguese, and telecommunication device for the deaf capabilities. Enrollment is easy. Create an account or enroll as a guest. Please do not create a login with Google, Facebook, or Twitter. When you go onto the link, there it will say that you can sign up uh, through Facebook or Twitter, so don't do that. Uh, go through your, your email. Um, all right, and the second public announcement that I have for today, today is also PTSD, Post Traumatic Stress Disorder Awareness Day. This Awareness Day is an awareness for an opportunity to draw attention to PTSD raise awareness of treatment available for those affected and provide support for individuals who are burdened by this heavy disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder results from having experienced or witnessed a terrifying event. The most common traumas associated with PTSD are sexual and interpersonal violence. Being involved in a car accident, uh, excuse me, the most common traumas associated with PTSD, um, being involved in a car accident, witnessing serious injury or the death of another person, or being in combat. Those experiencing PTSD often struggle to control their emotions and may have unexpected, unexpected outbursts, often straining supportive personal relationships and causing them to feel alone or uncared for. Many individuals suffering from PTSD also struggle with depression and substance abuse. Help is available, seek out help. People's mental health matters. If you are a veteran experiencing, symptoms, experiencing the symptoms of PTSD, please call the VA crisis line at 1-800 273-8255. If you are someone or someone you know you, you love is struggling with PTSD or mental health, please call the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Admin Hotline at 1-800-662-4357 or the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255. That's all I have for public announcements, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Haggerty. Uh, Kevin? Yes, I just have one. <clears throat> uh, Tenth District Brewing Company and Abington Celebrates have partnered to come up with a perfect beer to celebrate Abington's 310th birthday. Brewed with Irish malt, this lager will be available in a limited edition, specially designed can inspired by Abington's rich history. Please join the Abington Celebrates Committee at Tenth District Brewing Company Tap Room at 748 Brockton Ave on June 30th, 2022. The doors open at 4 p.m. with the unveiling of the Abington 310 Celebration Lager planned for 6 p.m. 
Abington celebrates events would not be possible without the support, cooperation, and hard work of Abington's police and fire departments, Department of Public Works staff, Board of Selectmen, and its many volunteers and community partners. Please join us as we raise a glass and salute some of the important groups that make Abington great. We want to honor all that, all that they do by allowing them to honor the uh, by allowing them the honor of the first poor and unveiling of this historic collaboration. There will also be a birthday cake provided by Cake Connections and the Cheesy Chicks food truck will be on site. So. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Tim? I have nothing. Michael? Nothing to me. And I have nothing. So the first item on the agenda, we're going to take the agenda a little bit out of sequence and we're going to go right to the badge pinning ceremony. Thank you. Deputy Glenn's getting the members of the Abington Fire Department in. We're here for a badge pinning and a swearing in ceremony for our newest firefighter paramedic uh, who just joined the department last month. Just give them a moment to get in. While they're coming in, this is the 21st firefighter I have been able to hire as your fire chief since I took over uh, to have a badge pinning ceremony at, at your events as well as the entire command staff that I was able to um, work through the promotion process. So thank you for all of allowing us the time to do this each time. Um, I know you have a busy agenda tonight. I'm going to keep this brief. I don't have a golden retriever puppy, so that's going to kind of <laughs> speed things up somewhat. Um, that is a tough act to follow. I'll do tell you that. But the police are doing a great job. Do we want one? We'd love to have a puppy. We don't really have room for it right. at the moment. Um, Not well, that I was offering. I was just here. For you. <laughs> is everybody, Andrew, are you here? Andrew, you want to come on up? So I'd like to introduce to the town uh, of Abington. This is firefighter paramedic Andrew Macedo. That is correct, right? Yeah. Said, okay, <laughs> Macedo. Um, Andrew comes to us from the, um, the city of New Bedford, where he was working with the New Bedford EMS department. Um, he was hired back in May, and he's been on shift since then doing training, and he actually begins his first official shift without the safety net of having extra people on board this Saturday. That notice is coming out this week, Cap, I'll let you know. Um, very impressed with his paramedic skills. I've, I'm hearing that across the board with his uh, patient assessment skills. He's not shy. He's getting right in there. Um, he's, he's a quick learn on everything he's been doing. Very impressed with everything that we've had um, with him so far. Um, and I believe your, your girlfriend, Teresa, she's going to do the badge spinning. Teresa, if you want to come up. How do you do? Nice to meet you. So try not to hurt him. Sorry, I'm his mom. Oh, I'm his mom. Nice to meet you. I'm sorry. I'm Adams, our town clerk, she's going to swear into it. I don't want to, um, I'm not sure what the next item is, but if we hang for, if you want to hear the report from Holbrook Dispatch, that may be a perfect uh, segue into that. 
Well, that's a second item I'm going to bring up. Uh, I'm going to bring up, if you're all through. Absolutely, thank I'll you. I'll bring up Steve Hook from the Holbrook Regional Emergency Call Center. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chair, board members. I hope you are well. Um, Director Steve Hook from the Holbrook Regional Communication Center. I have Deputy Lauren Milky with me tonight. So, um, as you know, we uh, have the responsibility of dispatching Abington Fire, Abington Police, and uh, answering your 911 calls here in town. We have been dispatching Abington Fire since 2012. Uh, recently, six months ago or so, we assumed dispatch responsibilities for the police department and your 911 PSAP. So things are going well. Um, last, last year, we received just under a million dollars to assume the dispatch responsibilities for Abington Police. Uh, and I'm happy to report this year as part of the uh, FY23 State 91 Department Development Grant, uh, the Town of Abington, through our agency, will receive $898,351.72 as for uh, equipment and capital items uh, for dispatch uh, services. So some of, just some of the, uh, the items that were requested, and these requests came from the, the two chiefs, uh, the police chief and the fire chief, and we submitted on their behalf. So um, some of the equipment is uh, the MDTs for the cruisers, so we're purchasing all new MDTs for the police cruisers. Uh, we're, we're upgrading fiber optics from Holbrook to Abington and inside the town here itself, um, some fiber optic cable. Uh, we are installing new microwave equipment to all the radio sites that will be the backup to the fiber. Um, we are also uh, doing some, re putting in some re redundant equipment um, as well. I don't want to get too, uh, too in detail because it's kind of boring, but uh, we are also installing for the fire departments, both fire departments, both fire stations, we are uh, installing PA system and upgrading their uh, st station alerting once again. So. Uh, in addition to that, in addition to that, we are uh, purchasing and installing a generator for this uh, facility, a town hall here, as part of this project as well, because there's some critical infrastructure here as well. So uh, that's all. I'm happy to answer any questions, but um, we did receive that funding, and I just wanted to report uh, on behalf of the Holbrook Regional Communication South. Thank you. Any questions from the board? What was that total again? Just eight hundred ninety eight thousand three hundred and fifty one dollars and seventy two cents so uh, going forward um, will we be receiving more money for other upgrades yeah so it's a competitive grant um, but we have the opportunity being a regional center to apply for additional equipment and we we will apply every year uh, based on the town's needs and whatever we assess that we continue forward right upgrading radio equipment up you know th there's a lot of different items that we can procure thank you you're welcome any other qu any questions from the audience or the fire department you know, and I'd, I'd like to point out though that um, these these are a lot of items that otherwise would have been on our capital plan right. and um, we realized back in uh, January storm how critical it was to have power at this building right. um, when it went out around town, and this is going to, um, you know, really help us. You know, we'll be able to use a, as a warming center if needed, a charging station if needed, um, whatever. But more than that, we'll also be able to stay in communication right. with other departments in the town. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for your support. Right. Thank you. <coughs> and in closing, and I know the question is why was 911 buying a generator for this building? To piggyback on what the town manager just said, during a lot of the storms, this is really the hub for the town communication system, whether it's the fiber network, whether it's the telephone system, and our emails. And we had lost those previously when there was power outage to this building. Uh, for us to lose our emails, that, that's a big deal because it's not just communicating back and forth. Those are also notifications. Since then, our IT director, <coughs> Wayne Newling, has found a way to kind of make a bridge to protect that, but this is really going to solve the critical infrastructure. When we went to the, for the emergency generators a couple years ago at both fire stations, this doesn't want to hang up here. 
Um, we, we also priced to get one for here, and at the time, we just, the town couldn't afford it. So this really closes that gap. So um, he's really helped to build in the infrastructure that we have here. So with no further ado, I want to thank you again for your time, and let's get back to your meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Chief. Thank thank you. Chief. Okay. Um, we bring Vinny up. In 645, we have a meeting with Vinny DeAndre regarding activity at... Um, you can probably merge that right Yeah. Um, 43. 43. It says 343 uh, Highland Road. And also, um, I think before we meet with Vinny, let's go to item number one, and that is to vote on the commercial garage license that we held off at the last meeting because of uh, some concerns that the police and fire had, but it turns out that it was not with this particular tenant. So um, I'd entertain a motion to renew their license. I'll make a motion to approve the license for Champion and Garage. A second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. The ayes have it. Okay, Vinny, um, the reason, um, if you want to come up, the reason we had asked um, for a list of your tenants and what was going on there, as you know, you had a tenant, I understand that that tenant's gone now, that um, was causing some issues, and apparently most of the police and fire calls that were going on was because of that tenant, is that correct? Uh, that's correct, but also other phone calls were made to other people. You and I had a conversation at Lowe's. Mm -hmm. You said you'd be there to help out. Scott, the KBR office with a booklet showing all these uh, laws that were broken, selling alcohol, selling drugs, prostitution. Uh, all these things went on for, since they moved in there in July. It was supposed to be a podcast company. The town never made them come in and get any licenses. There was no, no license required by this board for that. It, it's entertainment. Not if they're just doing a podcast there, then there well, it isn't. Okay, well, then what about the after hours? Well, the they after had, hours, that's no where the police, and <coughs> police department comes in. Well, no, they were running a business after hours with gambling prostitutes. Benny, it's and not up to us to evict your tenant. I'm not asking to evict him. And they were breaking every law in the bylaws. And that's what the, the police handles that, not the Board of Selectmen. They didn't handle it. Is the chief here today? No, he's not. No. And this chief was not here during that time. Okay, well, nobody did anything. Kevin, point you is, have my uh, my the ma the uh, notebook that you supposedly had sat down with the chief with. Is that, yes, I sat down. Yep. Yep. That was back in December. Yep. Our conversation with you, Alex, was in September. Mm hmm I believe yours was shortly after that. And then uh, Kevin, I, you that was December. Do you have that book? What's that? Do you have that book? No, no, I mean no. Do you know when you can get it or have it back to me? I gave it to you. You you never gave it to me that night. You made copies actually. Okay. If you recall. You got the copies of that? I, again, not on me. Right, but you yeah. do have them. You yeah. can get them to me anyway. Yep. Back, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, listen, I reached out to every board member, everybody here. Okay, so the point is that, that tenant is gone? Yes, it is. Okay. So we had asked, who do you have in there for tenants now, and what well, are they doing? My lawyer says it's not important who else is there. I'm not going to answer the question okay. as far as who's there. Then I guess this conversation's over then. You're right. All right? Okay. Chief, would you like to say anything? Thank you. Just for clarification, because we were aware that there was a problem tenant. A lot of this was a police matter. However, there were some fire department issues as well, um, possibly either tampering or um, altering fire department alarm notification systems, i.e. the smoke detectors alarms. So we were aware of that. We found out about it after they had been repaired, and I explained to Mr. DeAndre that that really had to be done, you know, let us know when it's actually like that, not after it's repaired, because at that point it's a moot point. We need to see it. We, he was also trying to get us to go in to inspect just that problem tenant. However, the way I had left it as the chief of the department, I says, I'm not going to cherry pick one place. If I'm going to go and inspect the building, we're casting wide net. I'm inspecting the entire building, all units in that building, and we'll see what we'll find. We're not looking for things, but I'm also not going to single one potential person out, because we're not going to try to evict a tenant for him. We were never able to see him, we never able were to get a commitment from him to be able to go in to do that. That's kind of where it stood, and I believe at that point the tenant had left anyway, so 
Our inspections up there with the licensed garages, the commercial garages, and I think there's only one that are up there. Um, we have no issues with. So, thank you. You have no concerns over the building. I do not. The safety of it now. Okay. Correct. Did, did you ever get into the building to this to date to do any, any inspections since that? My fire time? prevention department did. My my deputy and captain did. Since I, I'm familiar with the building, but I haven't been since since then. We we haven't okay. for a while. But we also have had no other complaints in or had a reason to go up there for an emergency okay. that, that I'm aware of. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Anything else from the board? Asking for clarification, um, when was the Board of Selectmen notified with this? Well, Alex was notified probably the first one. He's the one I first one I ran into. And he said that he would, he would make sure that the town would help out with trying to evict these people because of all the laws they were breaking, okay? The police were letting them I, I think my words were I would look into it. I did not. I never okay. said we'd assist right. you with uh, <coughs> evicting. But we would look into if there were anything, if there was anything illegal going on, that we would look into it. The police were in the in the building on the end of August when they had over 500 people up there. Okay, in a big huge party, they had to call Weymouth Police, Rockland Police, Whitman Police, Sheriff's Department. I don't know why the state police weren't available, but they weren't. Okay, I get a phone call at 2 in the morning asking me to come up to the building to uh, be able to access a unit, and um, which I did. I got there about 2.30. Uh, I guess the bulk of the people were gone. There was about 75 people that ran into the unit, locked the door. There were six officers left. They said they asked me if I had keys. I said, yes. I said, okay. They said, well, can we go in? I said, yep, let's go. So we went to the door. because I asked them if one of them could get in front of me with a vest, okay, but... He didn't. He says, well, no, we have to go in behind you. I said, okay. So we went in the building, knock on the door, open the door. It's after hours. The town bylaws, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., unless you have extended hours through the town in a hearing. I told these people a million times. So that was in August. This whole party regime went on until September, February, okay? That's when they found guns in there. They found uh, all kinds of stuff, paraphernalia, and... Uh, you know, the stripper pole and all the other odds and ends that were in there. Um, you know, it just, and they finally broke in. The police chief should have all records of all this stuff anyway. So he's inquiring why that address came up so often. It was because of those things. He didn't read his police reports. I had the drug dog go through the, through the building. I had the, uh, the, the police were there probably three or four times from the break in. They broke back in and stole stuff out of there. Um, but nobody did nothing. So. How many uh, rental no. units do you have in there? There's 12. How, How often do you inspect all of them? Well, I inspect them all. Well, as a ten, as a land. every time. Well, I I have the right to go in there any time I want. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. But if there's any illegal activity, yep. Okay. I don't want. Well, we do now. I don't want. I don't want to see anybody get uh, hurt on my building. Yeah. I don't want to see anybody right. get killed. Right. Okay. No, that's when these officers went up there that night, I don't know how many they were. All those people that were there had, a, had was pushing the pushing the police officers back. And roughing them up. Were there any arrests made that night? <coughs> not to my knowledge. Was anyone um, PC put into protective custody? No, 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 again, any, I got were there. Any charges? Was any summons? Anything? Anyone summons to court that night? <laughs> no, nobody. No, no. Okay. So Just, what happened? Kevin? That was one night. But you said you said they've had guns, paraphernalia, right. a drug dog. That's went we found out. Police there three to the four times. The guns and all so the stuff we how, found. How many times have the police been there? Is it uh, three to probably, four times only, or how many times? No. I want to Can say you give maybe me a number? eight or nine times. And for those eight or nine times, has anyone been arrested those eight or nine times? Nope. Has anyone ever been taken into protective custody? No, but if you read the police report... Has, has the... anyone ever been summoned to court? No. Those, okay. So do you feel that the, the Abington Police Department is not doing their job? No, they're not. Okay, so, so I'm, not tr I'm trying to get where you're going with this. Well, where I'm going with it is because in job. August, when they went in there, they were smoking, they saw the signs that booze is for sale, they saw everything that was there. Did they make any reference to the um, this is ABCC? Did, was there anything? Was there any the referrals ABC? put up? Yeah. Yeah, I called them. They said they but couldn't do anything. But I'm saying, did any. the Abington Police Department make any referrals? No. No. Nothing. And when you called them, did they come out? I didn't call them. They were already there when I got there that evening. So they were there. So they were they, there, and I don't know how long they were there any for. sort of arrests? Did, it, did they make any charges? No, they made all the charges? reports out with all the information about the alcohol being sold, marijuana. 
uh, and uh, the party going on. So you're saying they listed that in a report, but yes, nothing else was done with it. You have they a didn't copy make of the any report, summons, yeah. anything like that. I'm not asking about that. I'm asking you directly. Yeah, no. They did, so, they did, so the they ABC did nothing. was there when you got there. They did not summons anyone. No, no. charges were made. No, no one was arrested. But you're telling me that they wrote a report that they found all this stuff, all this illegal activity, and they did nothing about it. Correct. Do you feel that you have, do you have that the ABC did not do their job that night? The ABC said they can't do anything because they don't they don't have a liquor license. <clears throat> so the ABC admitted that there's no liquor license, and then they admitted that they found liquor in the building. No, the police department saw the, the liquor. Okay, it's just very confusing. So, well, hang on. Well, let me uh, explain so it for you a little the, better. The, okay. But hold on, the guns that were the guns that you said were found yep. there were those yes. confiscated. Yeah, they were. They have the police took them and they found out that they were prop guns. Well, they only were prop two guns. of them. Okay, so, so two of them. So two of them had serial numbers. But hold on, two let's of them rephrase them. this. So they're not guns. They were prop guns because they we, turned out to be prop guns. Okay, so when you said guns, let's talk. Let's say they're a prop gun. They're, yep. that's not a gun. It's not a yep. firearm. That's important. Well, it's a firearm. What, it looks what did like they a, find for paraphernalia in that building? They had, uh, they were, uh, what do they call the uh, what blocks. Did they, what did they find for paraphernalia in that building? Well, there was marijuana. There was uh, grass all around. Uh, you know, I don't know, marijuana. So, okay. my, my last question <coughs> is, Yep. What, what do you do to screen a, a tenant? I own a multifamily, so, so I do a very thorough screening. Residential I've never had different. an issue, but that's Resident. fine, residential, commercial. I'm asking, what do you do to screen your tenants before you move, so that you, you would move someone forward into that building? I don't, I'm not afforded to be, be able to do background checks like you can. Okay, you can run background that, that's checks. That's fine, what do you do? Okay. I'm asking what you do. Well, I typically find out what, how long they've been in business. I get all their paperwork, I get the copy of their license, their business certificate, <coughs> their, uh, all their insurance they need. Uh, the guy that came in there was, was uh, Michael Norton. He was uh, there as, a, as for uh, the uh, podcaster. Then his buddy came in as a, a uh, <coughs> you know, call it a, uh, a sportsman's. Were they sport, both sport on clothes. the lease? No. One, one signed as, the, as guarantor, but he's not on the lease itself. This okay. other guy, his name is Jeffrey Light. Okay? And then what he was doing was doing these uh, sporting, good, uh, sporting clothes uh, events with all these little girls that were coming in and trying the clothes on. And if you've been in the cable studio, it's two floors. Upstairs, he's got video cameras on the little girls changing clothes. Okay? Did you call the police on this? Well, I told them. Do you have evidence I told, of this? I told them. I told the police. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I this don't, is important. Go ahead. Do you have evidence of that? You I have evidence it? of the cameras in there, yes. I know that you said there's cameras there, but you just said that they were videotaping little girls changing. Do right. you have that? that is a I don't have the evidence. They have the videotape. They have the, they have the tape. They who, told who me what the they're doing. Who has the tape? The owner, Jeffrey Light and uh, Michael Norton. Okay, <coughs> but there's only one person okay. on the lease. So what did you do as far as your lease with the one person when you found out there was a second person in there doing a business that was not on the I lease? I told them they can't, <coughs> they can't sublease. It's in the okay. lease. And, and what happened after that? Nothing. Arguments ensued every day. Okay, they were they were causing all kinds of problems for the other tenants, parking cars in, in front of in their in their bays in their uh, un, in front of their units. It was an absolute nightmare. So what process <coughs> did you did you initiate? What process? On, as a well, let's see. Landlord. I called. I call, besides the local officials, looting the fire department. I'm, uh, I'm not talking about local officials. I'm talking yeah, about you I as a landlord. The state police. You I as a landlord Cruz. in that lease. Yeah. Go ahead. Did you what what process do you take? Not not calling a local official. You have a lease with a person. Right. Did you handle that? In default. As a They're landlord? in default. They were handed default notices all the time. Okay. And so okay. where is that right now? Well, they're out now. I finally evicted them on the saying, So you, you sent the default notices and yes. did you did you pursue that in court? It is in court. Okay. It's currently in court. Currently in court. Okay. All right, Benny, you said you have twelve rental units here. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to tell us who's in there, no. which is fine. But you also just said before you rent to anyone, you get a business certificate. Yes, I have business certificates. So the there's only two people listed here at that address with business also certificates. State, state, state businesses. State they businesses? They log with the state. If they log with the state, they don't have to log with the town. So everyone there is either a corporation or has a business certificate from the town of Abington? Yes. And you have proof of all that? Uh, yes. Okay. Anything else, guys? All right, thank you, Vinny. Back to my question, when did this occur? Because I was this not start, notified. Start of, started in July. Well, they, they came in in July. <coughs> the first, <coughs> the end of July, they, that's when they disarmed the, the uh, 
fire alarm system for 26 days. Okay? That's when I brought my uh, log report, my alarm report to the uh, chief and said, listen, you know, this is 26 charges. These guys have dismantled the uh, fire alarm, which affects you know, all these other people, all these other tenants. And then from there, it went to this big melee at the end of uh, uh, August. Um, when I say melee, I mean, I just heard that all these police departments were there, and they told me it was four or 500 people there. But they were fighting with the police, um, pushing them, shoving them, calling them names. Um, you know, I don't want to see anybody get hurt. Nor do I want anybody that's up there drinking and doing drugs, get behind the wheel and leave, okay? And kill somebody in the town here, a child, an adult, or anything else, okay? I lost my son 14 years ago, and it's no joy, okay? And um, I did everything I could to make sure that no, everybody was safe. But nobody was listening. I did call the state police, Dr. Trooper Morrissey. I did talk to Tim Cruz, who called you. Um, and we had our conversations. And time has just gone on, <clears throat> and uh, I just couldn't take it, and I just ended up just evicting him and uh, threw him out, and fights broke out, and I just, whatever. I was just disappointed. It didn't have to go that long and take up that kind of time. The police know that there was unlicensed drivers driving up there. I gave them that they, information. They know that? Yes, they do. So Kid, they, Mike, they Kid Michael Norton, up? at least, he gave me, a, uh, I thought it was a license. He showed it to be a mass ID. He doesn't have a license, but yet he was driving. So I, I spoke, took, spoke to the officer that came to the scene. When he showed up, I showed him his paperwork saying it's just a mass ID. And, but he's driving a car on, on the property. Now, I don't want people to drive on the property if they don't have a license, period. I don't want the liability to follow me for any reason whatsoever. So, so. And there was an accident on property there that somebody drove over one of the rocks there, left half their car behind. But I was surprised they drove away, but they did. So they had to have been screwed up, you know, either high or drunk. I don't know. I'm not a cop, so I don't know. I'm not going to be there. I did what I could when I could. I'm kind of lost for words. Yeah, so am I. This is a pretty big situation. Sitting here as a selectman, why the hell did I, we, this is only the first time we're talking about this, and it happened in July. Uh, I spoke to Alex in September. I spoke to Kevin in, in December. He said he was having a meeting with the police chief in December, and he'd get back to me. And, and these are I got no calls. serious allegations. And yes, they are. Why is this the and more importantly, sitting up here as a selectman, why that? Why the hell did I not know that this was going on? Why was I not shared with this information? I don't think there was an official complaint lodged with the Board of Selectmen. <clears throat> not only that, but that podcast did not license and the BRS. The police, I mean, yeah, we're not, we, the police don't tell us everything they're doing, trust me. Yeah, well, I mean, the, we're not, no, we're we not we the want police. Them to. No, we need them to report to us each time. I'm not talking about the, the police. Our yeah. direct communication is with Scott. Yeah. Scott, yeah. if this was a big situation <coughs> going on here, wh why, am, why am I sitting here at being the last to know? I don't know. Were you on the board then? In July? Yeah, I was. When this all happened? Because eh, I'm not really sure why you don't know. Um, it was discussed with some of the gentlemen here. It was discussed. It was a police matter. Um, at that time, I want to say we were probably between chiefs when it first happened. The building inspector knew. And he's no longer he's here. Gone. What, well, the good news is the tenant is gone, and uh, yeah. hopefully there's no more issues up there. What, Shouldn't be. Why yeah. did you not let the fire chief in at the time? <clears throat> he was trying to make it a different issue. He came up and did one inspection. <coughs> but Excuse me. Wait a minute. Let me just tell you, tell you what yeah, it was, yeah. okay? He came in there. This guy had all this, I want to call it cotton, hanging from the ceilings, like it was some like a display mood, or something. mood thing. You know, like a, no, like a you know, mood thing. Or, yeah. You know, and... Uh, and stuff, so he's oh no, all that stuff's got to come down. In the meantime, I'm saying to myself, listen, you got to tell the guy he has no fire extinguishers in here. He's got no occupancy for, for, for how many people can be in there, okay? But yeah. you're in charge of your building. Wait a minute. Not the fire department's flaws. They, <laughs> they regulate the amount of people. 
You're in charge of your building and yes, making sure you have fire extinguishers. No. You are. It's it's up to the tenant it, to supply the tents. Not all tenants require certain fire extinguishers. I, I understand okay. that. I understand so that. I but if you have a they, tenant that's doing something, yeah, it's it's on you to make sure you have the proper fire I have, suppression. I have the right fire suppression. I have manual okay, as well then as automatic. Okay, shouldn't have been an issue. I guess my question is why what? why did you not especially with Don't everything put it on you, me, let me tell you <laughs> everything you're it's saying your building right, it doesn't yes that's right but every tenant Blaming has to have their doesn't own doesn't make you it's innocent a commercial garage would have certain certain extinguishers it's still, other it's still your building so still how do you know that all the, the your tenants department. how do you know all your tenants have the proper fire system? I, I was going to say do you do you do a, how often do you go into each one of your 12 tenants and do an inspection on it um, maybe once a year once a year. So, I mean, so when you go in, I mean, are you checking for fire extinguishers? I look for, for hazards. Depression? I look for fire are hazards. Are you checking, like, any of these things? Do you know so when you're the not going to let the fire chief in there to inspect each he unit. He wants to inspect every unit. And there, he but should. there's 11 other units here that are all law abiding pe people. But How do you know that? I know it. You know they have the <laughs> proper fire extinguishers. So, according to you, this former tenant wasn't. Mr. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Mr. Excuse Excuse me? One person so, so hold on. So, what I'm saying is, you have. You, you have all these issues with this one person, and you're yes. saying, so, so as much as you're telling me that, the, uh, telling this board that the chief was picking one person, you are as well. But, but no, what I'm, I'm picking what I'm the person that's the problem. If, if, you were, if you were so confident on the other 11 businesses in this one business that you feel is the, the bad one, and there's everything wrong, it would have only helped you to have a fire chief come in there and do an inspection of your property. It doesn't matter if it was one unit, but 12 he, units. he doesn't have to Front do to everybody. He has to just do the one that need, that's having the violations. And yes, that's they're, what you they're that's what selling you want. alcohol, they're selling drugs. God knows what else. The he, ATF he is a, wouldn't he is get involved. He's like not it, looking for drugs. They were selling guns. He's a fire chief. He's, he's not looking for drugs when he goes in there. What I I'm know. saying is, you are a landlord. Right. Yep. You are in charge of that entire building. Correct. It is on you. You. Yep have leases, you rent, you lease those and units. Not the, the Board of Selectmen doesn't lease your no, units. They don't. You as a landlord, you as the owner of the building do it, not the Board of Selectmen. It is not our job to lease your building and to, and to police it for that. That is you, the landlord, and that is your lease between the landlord and the, the leasee. What I'm getting at is you have all these issues that you bring up in this one unit. You should have let the fire chief in, regardless of one unit or 12 units, front to back. Let them get in and look at the building. Well, you all if take you, it. If you felt there was nothing wrong with it and you do yearly inspections, great. But you would have had, you would have had, as you are making it out to be, a laundry list of, of violations that, that you could have had the Abington fire chief on your side helping you go to court or whatever it may be. I came with him in August, okay, two months after they were in there, after they had the, the fire alarm system broke down for 26 days. I said, that's 26 counts of tampering with fire, fire thing. Here's my uh, alarm company's report. Was it working okay. the day that you met with them? Yes, I got okay. it working. That's so, what I did. So, so it was, was it my was, job. It was working in the day you met with them, and, and he asked you to go through the entire building, correct? No, not that day, no. He said, oh, I can't help you. I said, what do you mean you can't help me? Here's, here's 26 days in, a, in an alarm report from the alarm company saying it's been, been out of service. So how do okay. we get from that to a full building inspection? We're that came later. This, this, is, this, is, this went on for eight months. Okay. okay? Everybody here took, took an oath to, to abide the, to buy laws and stuff, certain time frames. Nobody was listening to the time frames. All the action going on up there was going on after 7 p.m. Okay? Correct. So when it was reported as that, you people should have stepped up and said, hey, this is all going on. They have no license to be there. They have no operating license. They should be when, not doing anything after 7 p.m. But Correct me if I'm wrong, but you, yep. you said tonight that the police called you down there. That was one that point. one night. Okay, but after 7 p.m.? It was 2 o'clock in the morning. Okay, got me after 7 p.m., there was people yep. in the building. They called you down. Why did they call you? you are because the they all ran into the, into the building. But, but, there was you, are the, but people. you are the landlord, the yes. owner of the building. That's why they, they didn't call the Board of Selectmen to go no. down to your, to your building. They no. called the landlord to go down. No. And then when you said to put a, a vest in front of you, they said, no, you're the landlord. You are going in first. Right. Uh, do, do you see how this is laying out? You are the landlord. You were the owner of that building. I didn't have a vest on either, okay? Uh, yeah, yeah, but you are renting to this person. Exactly you're leasing, the person. You're leasing in, to this uh, person. Okay, I'm not going to be a hero today. I'm not going to get take a shot. Chief. These people. You want to okay. add something? So... Some of this is news to me, too, because I thought a lot of these things had been cleaned up and there were no issues there. The issues had been resolved. Obviously, hearing this, 
I want to get to the bottom of this. So uh, under Chapter 148 of the Mass General Laws, I am going to require a comprehensive inspection of the entire building, all of the units, in conjunction with the Board of Health, the Building Department, and the police to back us up if needed. We're going to find a mutual time that works for him realistically in a short time. We're going to go through the entire building and see if there's any issues, and we're going to end this. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Chief. So there's nothing more to discuss on this until we get a report back from the fire chief. No, I would just advise Mr. Andre, please work with our town officials. All right, that's all I ask. Kevin, as, as a board of can I speak you to you? Work, How many you times have I speak to you? To work with, with our How many board times have we talked on the phone? How many times, like say, I talked to Alex, I talked to them, I talked to Tim Cruz, who directed me to so, you, okay? Okay, so yeah, that's behind us. Let's move forward yeah, and get it resolved. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. You may have any other questions to ask. Thank you. Okay, and you'll report back to us, Chief, yes. once that's done. Thank you. Uh, next item is vote on accepting a gift of antique fire apparatus. Scott, you want to give us an update on that? Yeah, um, there is an uh, antique fire apparatus. I think many of us have seen it. It is down at um, Roger Woods. It's actually and at the highway department. Oh, it moved. It did. <laughs> Uh, so uh, Roger has asked if the town would like it, and they are you're setting up. Uh, are you setting up a uh, fundraiser for? We it? have um, a gift account that this board set up already for it, um, and there have been a few small donations. Uh, we have met with the, the community preservation commission, and uh, we'll be applying for some money over the next several years to restore the fire truck. Um, and in order to do that, it needs to be owned by the town, which was the intent all along. Yeah, and actually this board did vote to set up the fund. And right. And so forward. we need a motion and a vote to accept the gift from Mr. Woods of the antique fire truck. I'll make a motion that the town of Abington... Uh, Accept the gift of the antique fire apparatus from Mr. Wood. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. And. Any time? What's that? Is there anybody here for the bike ride? Which one are we talking about? The Habit to the Bay bicycle. Oh. Are you right? Yeah, where was that? Uh, 10. Ten. Anyone here for the Harbor to the Bay bicycle race? No? Okay. Then let's move on to Adam. Adam Gunn is a veteran services operator. Oh, the chief's officer. leaving. I was hoping he reached out and got my mother to take pictures as well, but it's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for allowing me to speak today. You want me to take your picture? <laughs> oh, good, thank you. Uh, just a few updates on a few things that have been going on from my office. We had the Abington Veterans Food Drive through uh, at the Senior Center last Friday. Allison Sullivan, a handful of volunteers, passed out over a thousand pounds of food to veterans who drove through the Senior Center yesterday. Uh, thanks to the wonderful Leanne Adams, uh, we also were able to give away 3,000 pounds of food to the local community and the Abington Food Pantry. Um, we, we're looking into doing this. Uh, possibly on a monthly basis in October, working with the Senior Center to uh, maybe do this on a monthly basis throughout the winter months. Uh, veteran stores, we just had uh, Colby Boyle, a prior senior at Abington High School, who's now in Marine Boot Camp. Uh, he interviewed Rick Franey and wrote his story. Rick is a Vietnam veteran with two Purple Hearts and also a retired Abington Police Chief. Uh, it's quite the story if you haven't read it already. All the veteran stories that are recorded and written are on the Town of Abington websites on the veteran services. If you'd like your story told or if you'd like to help tell one, please reach out to my office. Uh, the monthly veterans breakfast we've been having at Martin's now for a few months has been a huge success. In April, we had 64 veterans walk through the door and filled his restaurant. He served every single one of the veterans that walked through. Uh, we have guest speakers every month from the VA and various organizations. Uh, the breakfasts are free and open to Abington veterans the first Wednesday of each month, although uh, Martin's will be closed on the week of the 4th of July, so we will not have one in July. 
Uh, please thank Freddie Villa and Martins for allowing our veterans and his restaurant each month to be taken care of, and they take care of the bill and cover all the veterans' meals. The flagpole at the Rotary, uh, the Rotary project is coming along quite late nicely thanks to uh, the work that Liz Shea has put in. Uh, we did find a flag company, the All-American Airborne Flag Company. It's a veteran-owned business uh, who's taking care of the removal and installation of the flagpole. The flagpole, as you probably saw driving up here, was removed last week, and it should be installed uh, hopefully tomorrow, depending on the weather, but if not later this week. Later, Field Memorial, Troop 41 Eagle Scout candidate Mike O'Leary is working to restore the area in Ernest H. Later Memorial, as well as the flagpole that was put there many years ago. Last night, they had a fundraiser at the American Legion, uh, raised $610 for the project, estimated completion, uh, date and time still to be determined, but they raised uh, $610 and it's approximately $1,000 cost. Uh, SP4 Laidler was an Abington resident who enlisted in the Army and arrived in Vietnam on August 26, 1970. He was assigned to and served with a C Company, 228th Assault Helicopter Battalion. Later, they were serving as a gunner during a mid-air collision and became one of the eight men that were killed there that day. He's also honored at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. If you'd like to donate money for this project, you may write a check to Troop 41 and you can turn it into Troop 41 or my office. Uh, this Wednesday at 6 p.m. at the American Legion, we're going to have an Ambassador for Peace Medal Award Ceremony. Uh, this is for Korean War veterans that served boots on ground in Korea during the war and is given out, um, awarded, excuse me, by the Korean consulate. Uh, this Wednesday night at 6 p.m. we'll be honoring two living Korean War veterans and two um, deceased, Albert Donahue, George Cook, George Bizanson, and Neil Morgan. All are welcome to come and enjoy the ceremony. Please register by contacting my office. Purple Heart Town, the town of Abington, will join others in becoming a Purple Heart community. Thanks to the Highway Department, 90 Purple Heart signs will be placed on every street entrance into Abington, as well as on the entrance into Town Hall, which is traditional. On Sunday, August 7th, which is also Purple Heart Day, uh, we will hold a ceremony to commemorate the revealing of the first Purple Heart sign. We'll have Abington Purple Heart recipients present, as well as other family members of the deceased Purple Heart recipients. Uh, the first Purple Heart sign will be placed on Glenowitz Way, named after Richard Francis Glenowitz, who died through hostile action and explosive device on May 31st, 1969 in Vietnam. Last, but certainly not least, uh, Abington Veterans Services is now accepting resumes for part-time veterans assistant. Anybody out there? Uh, position performs detailed bookkeeping, accounting, and technical duties to oversee and track monthly payments to veterans and dependents utilizing Massachusetts Chapter 115 benefits for low-income veterans. If you enjoy working one-on-one -on -one with people, helping others, are savvy at bookkeeping computers, I'd love to have you apply. Go to the Town of Abington website and apply and come work with me and help the veterans in this community live better lives. Have any questions at all? Any questions for Scott? Alex? Do you have any like a do you have a write up on that assistant? I had someone ask me today if I could just get him some information. I do. I can do one to you. Awesome. Thank you. It's on the website, isn't it? It is on the website it's as well. Is it on under jobs yet? And Adam, what was the date for the Purple Heart dedication? August seventh. Sunday, you. August seventh. Thank you. Do you have a time yet on that? Time to be determined. Still okay. good. Thank you. Working with the American Legion and trying to fit their schedules since they're helping us out with all that. Okay. Thank you. Right, thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you. Okay, so I guess we'll go to the center school reuse update. Um, Come on up, yeah. You have one? <laughs> Good evening. Let me just, I don't want to miss any names. So we're here tonight, um, benefit of a technical assistance grant from Mass Development that we received last year. Uh, Amanda Gregoire, who works for Mass Development, wanted to be here but had a conflict in her schedule. So I said I would 
let you guys know Mass Development paid for this um, technical assistance. They reached out to the Barrett Group and engaged them who have um, prepared this whole report. This is Elizabeth Haney here with us tonight who has been sort of our main point of contact and has been fabulous. Um, we also received a $25,000 earmark from Allison Sullivan in last year's budget and that money paid for, <coughs> excuse me, the Habib Group which did the center school building study. <coughs> Excuse me. I also want to thank Pam and Ellen, who came to most every meeting we had in our check-in meetings throughout this whole process. And like you, they are volunteers, and this was extra duty for them too. So um, without further ado, I'll let Elizabeth. Yep. Uh, well, thank you for having me. Um, it's been great uh, getting to know Abington. Um, my name is Elizabeth Haney. Um, as Liz said, I'm a community planner with Barrett Planning Group. And sorry, my, um, let me just see, my, it's auto advancing and I need to stop it. Um, all right, hopefully this won't keep going without me. Um, and so, um, as Liz said, Liz and Scott have been involved as well as Ellen and Pam, um, at, who were representing the Affordable Housing Trust. Um, and tonight I'll be talking about um, some of the highlights from our site analysis, what we heard from the community. Um, we'll be looking at some case study schools for what other communities have done with schools that they needed to dispose of. Um, and then giving you folks a summary of the opportunities as well as the constraints and challenges and our recommendations. <coughs> um, so this is the site um, of where the center school is. So you can see it's um, tucked into a residential neighborhood that's um, kind of on the corner of Summer Street and Washington Street. Um, the school itself has entrances for cars on Thaxter Ave and Walnut Street. Um, and so some context for why are we talking about reusing this site. Um, so at the 2019 town meeting, um, the voters at town meeting voted to authorize the selectmen to dispose of all or portions of this property. Um, and so it's important to note that though the school is surrounded by parking and a playground right next to the school, um, the site's actually on a pretty big parcel. It's 13 acres, and that includes Murphy Field and a pretty big wooded area between the school and the fields. Um, and so uh, in talking with uh, <coughs> Scott Lambesi, the town's man town manager, he's indicated that it's the town's intention to preserve Murphy Field as well as parking and some access to the field. Um, and so some of the logistics for how do you get a car in there that's going to depend on what you do at the center school site, uh, so that hasn't been subdivided or officially protected in any way at this time. Um, and so we'll get into some of what we found in the site analysis. Um, so here's the school if you, if you didn't attend there. Um, but this is a school that was built in 1939 as part of the Works Progress Administration, um, and it is on town water and sewer. Um, and this is, it's kind of hard to read, but these are the original blueprints from 1939. Um, these blueprints are of actually the North School, but the North School and the Center School were sister schools, um, so they share the same layout. Six classrooms on each floor with a gymnasium attached. Um, and so here's a photo of, of the gym at the Center School, um, and then what one of those classrooms looks like. So uh, in pretty good shape, beautiful, red, beautiful wood floors. Um, as part of this work, the town contracted with a separate consultant, um, which was Habib and Associates. Um, so they actually did a code review and an assessment of the building's condition. Um, and so the, on the positive side, the things they found in that code review was that the roof framing is in good, good condition. Um, from what they could see of the masonry and the floor framing, there was no structural deficiencies. And the facade's in pretty good condition with a few defects. That said, the roof system has exceeded its serviceable life. Um, if, if you do reuse this building, it's going to need a new roof. Um, and there may be some deterioration in the first floor framing, but that needs to be confirmed by a structural engineer before you did anything with the building. Um, and if you do decide to reuse the building, it'll need all new windows. Um, so that's kind of the building. And then step, taking a step but back, um, you know, we wanted to highlight some of the natural features on the site. So you've got bedrock pretty close to the surface. Um, and then you do have that wooded area, and the picture on the right is the view of what it looks like if you walk from the school down to Murphy Field. This is an aerial view of um, what the site looks like from the air, so it really truly is tucked into uh, among a bunch of single-family homes. Both the field and the school are surrounded on, on all sides um, with single-family homes. 
Um, but, this, but the school is pretty centrally located in Abington. Um, it has easy access to shop, some shops and things like that over on Washington Street. Um, and it is within a, a three quarters of a mile of the commuter rail. Um, so here's an aerial just to point out kind of what it's close to. Um, and so you can see um, that center ring is a quarter mile, then it goes a half mile, then a mile. And so you can see that there's, you know, a few amenities within a half a mile, and then, you know, within a mile, um, you know, a really quick drive to the senior center, um, and pretty close to Target and Stop and Shop if someone wanted to do shopping from this site. Um, so part of, as part of our analysis, we also looked at kind of what's happening in the housing market and what's the need for housing. Um, so this is a chart of Abington's home prices from 2002 to 2022. Um, and so you can see from 2013 to 2022, the median home price um, has almost doubled. So 255 back in 2013, up to 500,000 um, as of the time we made this chart this year. Um, you see simil a similar trend in Abington rents. These are just rents in larger buildings, but um, what you can see is for a two-bedroom, rents are around $2,300 a month um, and projected to keep going up. And so kind of, you know, with some market analysis, we also looked at housing need and to kind of get a sense of what are folks at the Housing Authority hearing, um, we, we reached out to them and we got, we they told us what they're seeing and how many folks are on their waiting list. So um, for the elderly buildings that are in Abington, there's 109 units. Um, and the number of folks who are on uh, the centralized <coughs> waiting list, there's almost 4,000. And so you know, for those folks on the waiting list who are hoping to find a unit, there's about 8 to 12 units that are opening up every year. There are three family units that are um, part of that housing authority stock, or sorry, two. Um, and the waiting list for those, there's about 6,000 people looking for, the, for, for housing there. Um, and there's only two units, and those families you know, have found secure housing, so typically those units aren't opening up every year. Um, so that's some, com some context on kind of you know, what's the town seeing in terms of need for affordable housing. Um, and as part of our work, you know, understanding what is affordable housing wasn't, folks had different conceptions. So, one thing we like to do, so if you work in housing um, and someone comes into your office and wants, says, you know, I'd like to apply, you'll take their documents and their income and you'll compare it to this chart. And so what this means are there's different categories of income and then you look to see how many people are in the household and that's going to dictate whether folks apply. So, you know, someone couldn't qualify for low income housing. If they're one person, their income has to be lower than if it's a family with three kids. Um, but still, this doesn't really like make it fleshy for what, well, what does this mean? Who, who would this be? So one thing we like to do is to compare, you know, what, is, what does an income category look like against real jobs and real working people? So um, what you can see in here is um, we have wage data from folks who, this is wage data from Abington, careers in Abington, and what categories they might fall into. So you can see in the, under the low income category, a daycare provider who's married to an insurance agent who has one, one child, they'd qualify under, under the low income category. Um, whereas someone working in a nursing home um, with one child might qualify under the extremely low income category. Um, so that's just some background. And then um, we also worked with the community. We did a survey and did a community meeting. We had 351 responses to that survey. Um, and so what we found in the survey was that most folks who responded to the survey uh, reported rarely using the site. Um, and the concerns that most folks had were about added traffic and the impact of any development on the drinking water supply. Um, preserving the wooded areas on the site was extremely important, according to folks who took the survey, um, both you know, but the woods between the site and homes and the woods at the center of the site. We also found that the community was almost evenly split on whether to convert the school to senior housing or to demolish it um, to create more open space in Abington. Uh, when we zeroed in on the survey results for folks who said they lived in Abington, there was a little bit more support for creating senior housing. Um, and then I have a few slides with survey results that I can go back to, but I won't read them off just in the interest of time. Um, and so that's what we heard from the community, but then we also turned and we looked at what are other communities doing. Um, and so the, some of the schools that we looked at were the McElwain School in Bridgewater. Um, Auburn had sister schools as well, um, the Bancroft and Stone schools that they converted into affordable senior housing. 
um, in Bal uh, out in Baldwin Baldwinville in Central Mass. They're in the process of converting an old school into affordable housing and market rate housing. And up in Swam Swampscott, um, they converted a historic school into affordable housing. Um, kind of a, a different flavor, um, up in Pepperell, um, they had a much larger school, but they actually converted that school to a community center with an art space and a commercial kitchen. Um, that school was a little bit older, a little bit bigger um, than the other schools I just mentioned. And so in looking at all those schools, the kind of common themes that came out were some of the schools attempted to sell the schools for profit, but they, they didn't find any success, they didn't get any responses. Um, a couple of these towns used an RF, RF, RFI process. Um, so an RFI is a request for information where you ask um, the development community or community groups to give ideas about what should be done with the building. And some towns did that in order to know what they put in a request for proposals. And that's where you would actually um, go out to get bids on this site, or on a site. Um, in those communities where they added affordable housing and went through development, it was really important to involve the community and neighbors from the beginning. Um, and then again, when you're thinking about those, those RFPs, um, it's really competitive and it's hard out there. These towns only received one or two responses when they did put these um, schools out to bid. And then all, this, all the projects where they added affordable housing to the historic school involved adding more units outside the footprint of the school. Um, and some of these towns had success. They added the schools to the National Register of Historic Places and that opened up um, subsidies that they wouldn't have been able to get otherwise. Um, and local communities can be supportive if local dollars are contributed to a project um, and local officials submit letters of support. Um, this is just a little summary of you know, how many RFP responses and how long it took, how much it cost. Um, and then what the breakdown is. So um, you can see the, the blue and the red, that's the new building. The gold is how many units you fit in the historic school. Um, and so why did they add those additional units? Um, it spread expensive re rehabilitation costs across more units. Um, this is expensive construction. Those schools, in the case studies, it was 370 to 507 per unit to make those projects happen. Um, it also made them more competitive for uh, state dollars for subsidy so that you could use low income housing tax credits. Um, and it also meant that you know, if you're going to operate a building, you, it's big enough, you can pay a full time maintenance property manager, or if you're talking about seniors, having resident services there. Um, and so um, looking forward, some of the constraints and challenges that Abington should keep in mind. Um, the school is vacant and the potential for rehabil rehabilitation could get worse with no action. Um, neighbors who walked the site with us and folks who took the survey reported the schools um, often use it as a hangout site for youth um, who use it for drinking. Um, and you could see it when we walked around. There were broken windows and signs of trespassing, um, some spray paint. Um, and as we talked about in the code review, um, the roof has ended its serviceable life, so um, it would need a roof replacement as of today, and that's not in the future. Um, to get a sense of what it would cost if the town was to just demolish this, um, the town has worked to explore putting a new fire station at the, no the North School, which is a sister school, so similar scale, materials, vintage, and the quote that the town received for that um, indicated that it was going to cost about $1.2 million to bring that building down and to remediate the hazardous materials that were in that school. Um, and so then if you're looking towards how would you reuse the school so you're not demolishing it but you still have to rehab it, um, the consultants the town contracted with developed a couple typical layout plans. Um, so you can see it's really converting those old classrooms into apartments um, as well as the gym in this scenario. Um, and then just this is a slight difference, there's a lounge over in the gym. Um, and so if you were going to redevelop this site and shift those, um, those classrooms into apartments, you'd still have to deal with asbestos and you'd still have to deal with the likely presence of lead paint. Um, those layout drawings I just showed, they show about 15 or 16 units that could fit within the historic building. Um, they, that's probably ambitious because if you look back at these um, layouts, you'll see there's really skinny units over on the left side of the screen. And if you're thinking about seniors who need a five foot turning radius, that might be a little bit ambitious to say those, those side units could be appropriate for seniors. Um, 
And so if you're looking at, you know, we just want to use the, the existing footprint of the school, it's smaller than where the most money is, the state, is available at the state to make affordable housing happen. The state has this subsidy program called the Community Scale Housing Initiative, um, but that project has um, development cost limits of $350,000 per unit, so it's unclear if that would really work for rehabbing a historic school. Um, and then if you, if you are thinking about redevelopment, if you want to start digging on that site where there's that bedrock, um, that can increase project costs pretty fast. Um, so this, those are some of the constraints, some of the opportunities. Um, so this is a 13-acre site. Um, even doing some development on the school site, there should be, there, it should be possible to preserve some open space. Um, in some of those case studies I showed before, the developers actually invested in fields or playgrounds. So in Auburn, they invented, invested 25 grand in each of the playgrounds at those sister schools that they worked on. Um, using the site for housing could also address housing needs. Um, so if you go look at the town's comprehensive plan or the housing production plan, um, that has goals to both create more affordable housing for seniors as well as use town-owned properties to add affordable housing. Um, and then if you did have affordable housing on this site, it could contribute to the subsidized housing initiative where you're looking to get to 10%. Abington's currently at 7.7%. 7 7 um, uh, the site is um, fairly close to the senior center, so some folks say sometimes, you know, if you align services, that can be assisted living light for residents. Um, and there are some state dollars available to support um, projects with enhanced services like that. Um, so one unique opportunity at this site is if you did um, use this for 100% affordable housing, it'd be uh, kind of different than some of the 40B projects that Abington has seen recently. Um, some of those 40B projects, they're mostly market rate and they have a portion of affordable housing. This could be an opportunity to add 100% affordable housing. Um, and because it is, um, and because there are dollars available at the state level for affordable housing and at the federal level for uh, historic tax credits, um, shifting the school into affordable, into affordable housing could actually be a good strategy for preserving this school that a lot of folks in Abington have connections to. Um, and it is, would be possible to use, it's called the Local Initiative Program. Um, some folks talk about it as the friendly 40B. And so that's where the town can work collaboratively with the developer to make sure what's proposed is in line with you know, community uh, neighborhood ideals, uh, the community and the town, that the design that moves forward is something you work on together. Um, and so uh, our recommendations are to uh, clarify the status of Murphy Field. Um, so just to make, the community was very concerned about what was gonna happen there, but to um, communicate with them about what the next steps are in protecting that site. Um, to engage the developer community in the RFI process, um, that can help get the town kind of uh, understanding what would need to happen to convert this to affordable housing. You can get some ideas, some perspective designs visible. Um, and so that would fit into a larger planning process like this. So um, we went through a planning process and identified kind of reuse criteria. Um, if you did an RFI, you could decide whether you wanted to issue an RFP. Um, hopefully you'd get a developer with a proposal you really liked, and then they would go through a few rounds of applying for funding, um, go under construction, and then it um, would be ready for occupancy. And so, you know, this can be anywhere from three to five years. Those funding rounds can take multiple years. Um, uh, it seems like there might be no more public engagement on housing that would be useful. Um, there's kind of um, different ideas about what a, who would live in affordable housing um, and who it would serve. Um, and then some of the other communities, they had success where a developer was selected through an RFP and they actually had design charrettes with the, communi with the community um, and they helped design the building and the program. And so um, last, if, the, if you did want to move forward with, um, with renovating the school, um, getting the school in the National Register of Historic Places will make it easier to make the project happen. Um, it brings additional dollars that make that cost of construction, that cost of remediation um, lower. And so that can make it so that the project's actually possible. Um, and that's, all, that's what I have for you guys tonight. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Ava, that was good. Informative. Any questions from the audience?
please come up and uh, speak into the microphone and give your address. My name is Mike Wallace. I'm at 88 Summer Street. I have bought this property. Uh, I see you preserve, try, saying you want to preserve Murphy Field and a little bit of the woods. Uh, how come preserving all the woods aren't on the options? Everything everything's, up, on everything's an option. No decisions we haven't no. made any decisions. No, it's just when, when, you, when, you point, when you put it up on the screen like that and you got it all shaded and you got a big piece of woods not shaded. There's it nothing makes, proposed no. there yet. Yeah. That was my editing of a slide to show that the town's intention is to preserve the field in a way to get to the field. It's purely, it's sim symbolic. No decisions have been made on anything up there at this point. This is just all informational. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I mean, the survey results, I think they, they put preserving the trees over making senior housing. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's a safe bet that every tree will be saved on that lot. Ron, you, you were next. Ronald Howe, 149 Walnut Street. I also have bought the property. Um, at the community meeting that we had on Zoom, it was stated that uh, the town had no intention of expanding from the footprint of the school. And yet, uh, according to the survey and all the other um, example uh, projects or whatever, it was the school being reused, but then an additional building being built. Again, there's been no decisions made whatsoever. This is right. all purely informational. But I, I think it is important to note that, you know, that certainly any expansion of that building would probably be way too expensive. I mean, it, it is not that the bedrock is close to the surface. It's coming right out of right. the surface. Bedrock's there. there and uh, so really the, the other problem. part of it is, though, is, is to continue, look, we're going to spend either a million two to tear this down, or we can do a little more homework. And, and still, if we want to do an RFI, um, there may be some opportunities, and there may be a possibility that someone could come in there for a dozen or 16 units. Uh, I, I, you know, again, we may even want to pair it with the North School. You know, when we started this endeavor, the North School was still in play as a possibility. Um, for a fire station so we really focused on this but at this point um, if we wanted to go forward with an RFI we may even just bundle the two two projects together which may give somebody a, a development a that gives them the um, you know uh, the, the the cost as far as maintenance and having property maintenance might be more reasonable if they had both buildings and it may give them the number of units that if they could do them simultaneously it might work but at this point, um, you know, again, we're just kind of looking at what the conceptuals are. And it is good uh, to note, though, and I'm glad we did realize that, that most of these other uh, success stories did something that we're really not interested in doing, which right. is okay. developing the site. It's not, uh, it's very obvious to me and to just the discussions I've had um, the night that we were on the uh, Zoom meeting and then again in, in other discussions we've had that, um, the best reuse of that property is to preserve that wooded area, all of it, and to preserve that field, and to preserve access to that baseball field. Um, so that being said, uh, you know, using what we have is what is the road we want to go down. Okay. Where that'll lead us, I don't know. Um, it, at the end of the day, we may still be looking to spend a million two plus to tear it down, um, because then you'd have to you know, obviously fix the site after we've got a big hole. Uh, right. And, and if that's the case to create more open space, that's fine. Um, but I think we have to do a little bit more homework for us. Okay. But uh, let's be clear that these are all just ideas. Nothing is set in stone. The building's not being redeveloped tomorrow, um, if ever. So, um, these are just options that we're trying to look at to find out the best use of that in the North School and try and do what the town wants us to do. Correct. And I think, Scott, I was on the Zoom call as well. Uh, it was very much unanimous um, that preserving the footprint of the center school property um, and, and the woods, the, the park, that was, if there was one thing that we took away from that, was that's what the community wants. So I think any decision we do making moving forward 
we keep that as the forefront, that we are preserving the footprint. Well, and I think as Elizabeth will tell you, uh, the next step is asking for input from the development community. So the next step is to say what, what sort of thing would work and what would you see here? And if that's what they come back with and that, that's not what we're interested in, then we make a decision from there. Elizabeth, you mentioned, um, I, w I was kind of intrigued by it, the, the National Register of Historical Sites. So what, can you elaborate more on what, if we did, if, what the town could potentially get if it was deemed as a historical site? Yeah, so a, 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 if you, a town can put um, a building on the National Reg Register of Historic Places, and that opens up an additional source of um, tax credit equity that isn't available to a new construction building. Um, so the project in Bridgewater um, is a good example where they worked with a consultant to get the um, school on the National Register, and then that opened up um, additional dollars just to make a very expensive project less expensive because in each of these historic schools you know you, you have to remediate and then also you have to ensure the structures um, good for these schools and in a lot of cases that's more expensive than new construction Off, uh, maybe it, maybe this is too much but how much like hypothetically did or actually not hypothetically Bridgewater how did what did they receive to have that school be deemed as a historical place um, so I think you have to document the, his the history and submit an application to the National Register. Um, and so typically in Massachusetts, folks would work with a historic consultant in order to make that happen. So in Bridgewater, they worked with, um, I think the woman's name was Jen Goldson. And so they worked actually, before they put the schools out to RFP, they worked to get the schools, or to get the school on the National Register so that when they went to go do something with it, there was additional subsidy available. To make what they wanted happen. So I would caution that I think we would probably want to be really sure on the path that we're going yeah. before we do such a thing because so we don't want to make it difficult they, to do they something there. Right. They preserve that school and then add another building to that school? Yeah, it's, it, so it's in the very back of this uh, drawing. You probably can't see it. Well, it's not it, necessarily, yeah. I mean, uh, and I'm not looking to build more than a increased footprint again, but if you did that, you could still build an additional building. Like yeah. The North School, you know, seems like it would be a better site for that. Yeah, so uh, you, you, can, you can't really see it, but um, in the image on the right here, um, that's the Mary Stone School in Auburn, and you can't see it, but off the back of the school, they actually, um, they had an addition, um, and so it was, it's interesting, um, because it was part of a historic, it was on the National Register, it comes with a requirement. So the new addition had to look like it matched with the historic building, um, which was pretty interesting. Could, could you go an addition on, but could you, could you build up on these buildings as well, like if you wanted to build a, like a third floor onto it? Um, I am not a structural engineer, so I can't speak to that. Mm -hmm. It would be, be difficult on these buildings. I mean, if you're, you're going to make it ADA, you're going to put elevators, you have to put elevators in it. I'm just curious. I, th I think, it, I mean, it, at some point you just get to be, that per unit cost is going to be too much. So even even adding a third floor, you're only going to gain six units at best. I agree. I'm just, I mean, the buildings are but, as small as they are. Like, yeah. you look at that building in Bridgewater, they had 38 units. I mean, it seems like a lot of historic buildings are, are small, so you're, yeah. you have very minimal number of units. So, I mean, the, the cost is going to be high at that alone, let alone mm -hmm. building, you know, adding on, if you will. Yeah, it's certainly without subsidies and without the tax credits for it being, if we made it a historic building, I, I not a, it, we're not likely to see this project go forward, um, those things. But, um, you know, it's still a little early to say. Build a skyscraper. We can build a skyscraper. <laughs> <laughs> In Braintree. That's Kay DiMaggio <laughs> and Abington <laughs> Anything else from anyone? There's a oh, yes. Um, Please come so up and state your name. My name is Elijah Chris. I live on Walnut Street. I've been yep, use the microphone, please. Step yeah, right up to the podium right here. Recording. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. My name is Elijah Chris, and I live on Walnut Street. I've been on that property twice this week. My kids learned to ride their bikes on that property. Um, a couple of questions that I had. Um, one, I guess maybe just preface this, I couldn't help but feel when I 
read the survey and then listened to the discussion, the, the Zoom meeting, that very much of this seemed to be steered towards a certain outcome. And um, the question specifically that I had was when, in the survey that went out, um, where I know that the uh, online survey was available for residents to take, but I also know that there were paper surveys that went out. I was curious if we could be um, uh, made aware of like what portion of those were paper surveys that were returned in the survey results and also where those surveys were targeted to. Um, how were people given those surveys? Were they all handed out at the senior center or were they handed out, you know, to, to residences or whatnot because I do feel like this was pushed a certain direction even the language um, during the meeting and the language during our presentation seems to be how are we going to develop this and what kind of affordable housing options are we going to put into place here when in reality I look around and I see a lot of my neighbors and the conversations that I'm familiar with in town obviously we're very interested in this I haven't heard anybody that wants this place developed. I mean, I know that there are, you know, the, the senior housing um, committee wants it done. None of the neighbors do. What would you like to see there? Ideally, I would have liked to see the building not wasted to begin with. A fair amount of maintenance would have gone a long way. We've but got a bad are. habit in this town of letting our resources go to waste. Fair, but here you know, we are. So what, but, what would here, you like to see in there? So ma wave a magic wand. I'd put it. I'd put up. Well, we know it needs a roof. That doesn't cost 1.2 million dollars. We know it needs to be cleaned up. That isn't going to cost 1.2 million dollars to reuse it. There may be some abatement that's necessary. Um, but I would have liked to see the school restored before it got too late. If it is too late, bulldoze it and put a restore it to what? We'll, we'll, we'll but what, to what, what would you like to see there? Is my question. I, I know we all know what needs right, to be right now. That. Yeah, right at, now. At this at this point, yeah, I would I would love to see, I would love to see the building used for for the town's purposes, whether that be recreational, or I'd like to see it bulldozed, leveled, and left open for people to use. Um, and have the most importantly, I think the, the, let me just get to the, the gist of your question. Yeah. I'd like to see the, the town assume responsibility for its assets, stop trying to liquidate them, stop saying, you know, developer with a gleam in our eyes and um, hold on to what we have. I don't, I don't think anybody I've talked to feels strongly that we need to shove more residential units in there. But uh, specifically my questions again were, how is this how is this polling targeted um, I know I'm aware of online and anybody could have gone online to do that but a fair amount of it I know is paper responses I'm just curious where those came from I think the answer is coming yeah. up behind you okay. <laughs> thank you I filled out a paper uh, one by the way ah, you had the paper <laughs> surveys <laughs> yeah it was right down so they yes. were yeah. left down at the senior housing on Glenowitz way they were left at the senior housing on Shara because traditionally those are people without access to computers. It was to give them an opportunity. And I have to say, very few responses came from the one on Glenowitz Way. It was left at the senior center. It was left at the library. We brought it voting day. Town um, meeting. So town meeting, town meeting and <coughs> town hall. So those were your opportunities to grab a paper ballot. And online. So and you're online. Targeting seniors. Um, no, not, not voting election, day. With the, with the election day. The library, um, and then those other Town areas meeting. that Town traditionally meeting. they don't center. have access to computers. So, so I mean, yes. it wasn't a target; it was providing them an opportunity. And I can tell you, maybe four came from that senior housing well, down there. Maybe. Yeah, actually, yeah. It doesn't and say right in, don't we have? And I have problem? to say, at the end of the day, there was less than a hundred. And how many did you say we had responses? Uh, so you go. So, we. I mean, there's a pie chart here. Yeah. Right, this, this there's a there's a pie chart with the ages on there. So, so um, just let me just yeah, I mean real quick, eighteen to twenty four was five percent, twenty five to thirty four was eighteen percent, thirty five to forty four was twenty six percent, forty five to fifty four was sixteen percent. Fifty five to sixty four was nineteen percent, uh, sixty five to seventy four was eleven percent, seventy five and older was five percent. So actually the majority is eighteen to 54. I mean, that's three quarters of your respondents. 
And I just want to mention to you guys that um, I've talked to Kevin Tachi, and he's going to break this part out of, me out of your meeting, and we're going to put it on the Center School Reuse website, along with all of that documentation, awesome. all of the studies, and tonight's presentation. Um, and, and you had asked about the breakdown of you know yeah. what's paper, what's um, uh, what was online. So, so functionally, um, Liz, I think you entered the paper survey I into the online. Know. So the 351 is is all encompassing of folks who typed it in online, and then um, what Liz transcribed from the surveys that she picked up. Okay. It just it, the reason I had the question is that my conversations and, and not just with my neighbors, but with people around town. It, maybe I just come off as abrasive. <laughs> so I haven't heard many people that were excited about having affordable housing in the area. So if I if I can just add to that the. The idea, and, and, and obviously, you know, this is a piece of property owned by the whole town, um, is to make sure that before we move on with this, we're exhausting any other possibilities of reuse, as you said. Um, there was really no obvious use for it by the school department anymore. And there is a glaring need for senior housing and affordable senior housing in this town. It's not something that we're you know we made up um, so we just wanted to see if if this is a possibility to address it it's not that we're staring at one way or another um, but we want to do our due diligence so and um, as far as the affordable housing trust i won't speak for them i think they'll speak for themselves but they certainly um, were extremely open-minded in this process and i don't know that they actually support it one way or another at this point. Uh, this is care and custody of the Board of Selectmen right now. It looks like 450 people took it. That's what I'm getting out of this, that you know page. What? I may not have updated my slides. The survey received from 450 people. Yeah. If, I mean, if you do the breakdown on that, 65% was under 54 years old. So 300 people out of the 450 were under 54. And then 150 people were age 54 or older, or 55 or older. Yeah, I know that um, it was it, it was surprising in the surveys that we do with other communities that we work with. We were actually really impressed with the kind of uh, younger folks who came out to take this survey, which isn't typical in every community we see. Gonna be, yeah, it's going to be about $2 million. So um, one thing that we have to keep in mind to do the abatement of the asbestos and whatever needs to be taken out of there and demolish that building and make it a usable surface is probably upwards of $2 million now. So that's going to come out of our tax levy. How much would the it, roof cost? I mean, the roof, what, I know you were talking about the roof, but the roofs are expensive. I mean, well, the roof and the I, library, I would have, that has to be a close to a million dollar roof. Yeah, unfortunately, it probably is close to a million dollars. I mean, we just, I, mean yeah. I just got a quote for over the 20 So there's no so. easy answer here. And when we're just trying to look at everything, but if we were to keep it, it's going to cost us a million dollars for the roof. It's going to cost us a million dollars for the uh, asbestos abatement. It's going to cost us a couple million dollars for windows. We're so gonna, it, there's a heating system, everything probably. Before we make a decision, we're going to have numbers. I would be careful just throwing numbers out there. Well, we do have the guess, numbers. And I know it's an educated guess. We, no, we have the... Yeah. Uh, 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 the demolition number came out of the yeah. study for oh, the, the North, North School. school. Right. Yeah. right. And that was... I don't know how many years ago. But that's not included to this. At least two and a half, three years ago. 1.2 is not. That's no, not a good number. No, Those no are it isn't. guessing on new roofs where. Well, we're, well, we're, we're never. We're not there yet. We're, we're never going, going to put a roof on the building. Right. That's not right. something yeah, that we're right going there. to do. And if this does go further, we won't be doing it. Um, we would, if we finally decided, and I'm not saying we should or would or will, but if we finally decided 16 units of senior housing made sense there and that's what we found through an RFI that this was something that could be done and there was actual interest in it an RFP would go out and we would say to the development world tell us what you want the property is going to be yours the project's going to be yours here are the guidelines that you have to follow or you're not going to get this property and you're not going to get the project and those guidelines are going to be very specific to us but it is not going to be our project or our property anymore except for where like I said we would do um, a subdivision of land where we would keep the wooded area 
access to it in the ball field. Now that's, that's the biggest extreme at this point. Um, but unless we had some other critical use for that building that all of a sudden came up that was a town building, we have no intention of spending money doing windows, roofs, or anything else. It, it would. That's why I just warned that yeah. the more we talk in hypotheticals, the more misinformation or misconstrued we're going to be. And people I agree. Stop I, thinking. So I, I mean, we need to be more about action. Get the R. If we want to do the R. RFI. RFI next, mm -hmm. then let's do it. If we want to start with the historical, um, get an historical <coughs> status on the buildings, then let's do it. But I don't want to talk about uh, we could do this, we could do that. Four hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, three million. Because the next day people call and say, you know, I heard you put an ice rink up there for $100 million. Tim has a magical wand. We're putting an ice rink up there? <laughs> Santa school is going to be done overnight like this. That's uh, Tim Chief, Chapin. Uh, what do you have to say? Just quickly, just two things uh, the gentleman said. First, he said he's up there with his family. Um, I was up there last week. Our, our, our family, the firefighters, were training up there as well. And I was walking around um, the perimeter myself. And I actually went to that school. So I, I remember that school in its heyday. There's a lot of vandalism up there, both internally and externally. We have been working hard with, with the town to try to keep people out, to try to board it up. The kids are getting in there. Beyond that, the, the graffiti is not family friendly. There's no play way to put this. Um, I don't know how to correct that. I don't, you know, whether it's just painting over or whatever, but it, it's, it's getting, it's, it's deteriorating. So there's that aspect, and, I, and I, I'm aware of that, and so there's that end of it. The other thing is, you know, why aren't we using them now? It was very expensive to maintain both buildings. North and Center School are both the twin buildings, and when they became vacant, this all goes back to the sprinkler system with the fire department. <laughs> we always own this. They were wet systems, meaning that the entire buildings, the, the pipes, that the sprinkler, the sprinkler pipes are always full of water, which means you have to heat the entire building. And twice we had power outages during one of the winter storms. This is going back about four or five years. Both buildings froze. We found out about this, I think it was, if you remember, I think it was the North School that actually had the most damage, um, where the pipes were breaking and you know, we got the alarm, and when we realized what was happening, I immediately sent an engine to Center School to try to shut that valve down because the same thing was happening, which it did. Um, so there's an immense amount of damage with these sprinkler systems in both buildings. Um, it was I, the monthly cost to heat those buildings, um, it, it was going through the roof, and this is back about four or five years ago. So it, it's, I, I don't want to say the town just didn't maintain the buildings. It was extremely expensive, the upkeep for two vacant buildings that really could have gone um, on forever. So, you know, we tried eliminating some of the, just heating the boiler room. Uh, we worked on that for a while, trying to drain the pipes down, just heat the boiler room. But even that was, it, it really wasn't feasible. So that's kind of what led to this. So that if, if the town decided tomorrow, let's just open up the buildings, that's not going to be an easy fix because we, we did get estimates at the time to, can we repair the sprinkler system? It, it wasn't even worth it. And that was, um, wasn't worth it to maintain a vacant building. And that was looking at the visible damage that they could see without going through the walls. The buildings were both built in 1933, I think. So, you know, construction of that period, those, maybe the original sprinkler system from that period, um, early 50s at the latest. So that, that's kind of how they got in, into that condition, unfortunately. But I agree, we really, it is a shame to see the buildings in the condition they're in. I mean, we've taken care of the Frolio, but it is. Regardless, something needs to be done, so we need to move it forward. I mean, this has been way too long. The center school's getting the brunt of it because it's out of the way. The North School's really, what we're seeing, it's not getting the same vandalism because it's, it's so light open. Right. The center yeah. School's kind of up in the middle. Thank you, what a question? My name is Mary Snyder. I live at 132 Walnut Street, so my view is center school from my front porch, and I don't like the graffiti either. Um, my question is, you've loosely used the terms um, senior affordable housing and affordable housing, two different words in my dictionary. So are we looking to do 16 units that are just going to be senior, or are you looking at affordable housing, which could mean families? That's so no, I think the, the, the sentiment that we had in, in the direction we were planning was senior mm -hmm. housing. Okay. And it probably will have an affordable component to it, senior. Which I understand as senior affordable housing, but then when you get to family affordable housing, that means 
many more people than you would. Well, I don't think they'd be suitable at 800 yeah. square feet. They're going to be like one bedroom units. Yes. Again, yeah. I, I, but yeah. the idea, the, way, the, the idea, the state and, is. and the concern that I saw, and the concern is that I got from the affordable housing trust was there was a big need for affordable senior housing in this town, and I think some of the charts we show show that. Um, so yeah, that would be the direction that we would be going in. Because it seems like some of these towns, they started that way possibly and then added, like the one that added on and ended up with 38 units? No, I, so I can tell you, the schools in Auburn, mm -hmm. Auburn was similar to Abington. A Auburn identified a need for senior housing and they put out their RFP specifying that those schools were to be de redeveloped for senior housing. I believe Swampscott was similar. Um, but then in Bridgewater and Templeton, those are actually their family housing, so they are not age restricted. All of them are affordable housing, whether it's senior housing, whether it's not. If there's an income restriction, you could call that affordable housing. Um, and then if you, you do restrict it to a specific population, that might be 55 plus, it might be 62 plus. So if the schools on this chart, um, those schools in Auburn, um, those two sister schools, those are age restricted, and the school in Swampscott is also age restricted. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I know when we did the community outreach, Scott, on Zoom, the community, from hearing from the residents that if anything was to go in that school or development there, it would be affordable senior housing. I know because people in our groups were talking specifically against family housing, uh, affordable family housing, but more specifically, they wanted the town was centered on um, if anything, affordable senior housing. Well, like Scott and said, if it goes out to an RFP, we will specify what it has to be. And um, I think we're a ways. Because I know a lot of the residents, they uh, took away account that. just the, the services for the town if, we, if, it ha if it potentially would be affordable family housing. Um, no housing is affordable at this well, day and age. Well, true. <laughs> this is true. Um, but... Um, but yeah, it should be you senior. know the, the services, especially with the school department. Um, I think the sentiment is senior housing. Yeah, affordable senior yeah, housing. Affordable senior housing. Yeah, we did ask in the survey if, what, mm -hmm. what type of housing, and, and senior housing was the only one that jumped out. So. Okay, any other questions, uh, Kenny? Uh, Ken Coyle, 222 High Street, and I am not on the butter. Um, I'm also a member of the affordable, um, Abington's Affordable Housing Trust, which is fairly new in town. Uh, we're just getting our feet wet. We have a lot to learn. Um, we also have four members, uh, myself and three other members here in this room tonight, so I would hope that they are afford for affordable housing. In one of our very first meetings, um, it was decided that we wanted to bring affordable housing to Abington with a priority for Abington seniors and Abington Young um, in the form of low interest uh, first time home buyers loan. But our priority was affordable housing for seniors. So, um, and also uh, to note is I'm on the historical commission, so we will get right to work on trying to, you know, see if we can hire someone to get fast track, getting them on the historical. We probably have to wait to make sure it's something that's going to fit into the RFI. Um, I do want to make one note of the Bridgewater project. Um, and it's funny too, because I was driving by there and I saw it and I looked it up and I thought it was really exciting, but I'm kind of a nerd. Um, but it uses all three forms of the CPA funds. So historical, the school is historical. Um, it has a playground and back, a new playground and back. So it uses that um, form of park and rec money from the CPA. And finally, um, housing, obviously. So um, this is something that could happen up here, I, I really truly believe. Um, there's also a project in Rockland now with the Holy Family, Family School. Um, the difference in that is that that's privately owned. Uh, we have the advantage of owning this property. Um, I, I just read on it today, it's 27 units and the town is requiring that the builders make it um, 60% affordable, so anyone that fits in that bracket, you have to be, uh, mess, make less than 60%. And it's also age-restricted where you have to be 62, which um, I just turned 62, so maybe you might have to do I don't, want really, I don't really want to work, move to Rockland, but um, I just want to, I guess the question I think that our committee has is, is what is the next step and what 
do you need us to do? I would imagine that you would give us a recommendation as to what's going to happen to the property. Or, so we just kind of need to know, you know. And the other thing, I just want to make note, and I'm going to show my age, but I was on the Griffin's Dairy Committee, and we hemmed and hawed, we hemmed and hawed. Nobody could make a decision. And then it, finally the, the barn, the most historical feature on, on the property burned down. And it was sad. So this, every year we wait, and this is probably just not going to happen overnight, it's going to take years. So, and the building is falling apart, so we, we I don't mean to rush you guys, but... Uh, it's it's hope, been 10 years. Yeah, it, it, not, not, yeah, right, so not hopefully we can come up with something, you know, and again, we're not pushing either way, you know. We haven't taken, you know, Scott mentioned, we haven't taken any votes as to what we want to do with the property because it's not our call. You know, I was on the selectman when we decided to turn these two properties, nobody wanted these properties. And we were also smart enough not to sell them. We didn't sell them. We're hanging on to them. That's a good thing and a bad thing, you know, because we're hanging on to them. We might have to demolish them and pay for the fee to demolish them. Um, but we also made sure we're not selling it to the highest bidder. So that's a good thing. We, we own the properties, and that's going to help us when we go up to bid. So, Scott, what do you think is the, the next step? I, have, I would just, if this board um, would authorize us to um, begin the process for an RFI and get some interest in um, just to see what's in, out there for interest yeah. and if there's no interest then we're back to the even yeah. if there is interest it doesn't mean we mean let's find out we'll find out from the development community what they would have an appetite for and at what level of um, financial commitment would what, be on our side what and time frame are we looking for an RFI well, it, we could put it together fairly quick. I mean, it's fairly, um, it's an informal process. I mean, it doesn't have to, it's not like an RFP that's requiring, but, uh, so I think, I think putting it together, but we probably looking at a few months, <coughs> three to six months anyways. Okay. Yeah, we want to get as many, as much response as possible. Yeah, and I think that, you know, we'll discuss yeah. options that, like I said, bundle the two projects too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hi, I'm Pam Howe, 149 Walnut Street, and I just wanted to point out a few things um, that I, I got here late. I had a family emergency, so um, a little. I've uh, been helping my mom who had a fall. So anyway, um, we talked about the footprint of the school. Um, I also wanted, you know, just to make everybody else aware that there are two projects going in down the street from this. Uh, we have affordable housing, 40B going in um, down by the train station. That's got 200 and something units, I think, going in down there. Um, and then the other project across the street behind the senior center off of Plymouth Street, 144 units of age-restricted senior housing. Um, there's no sidewalks on Summer Street, so, you know, access to the senior center, you know, there'd have to be, there'd have to be cars. Um, you know, I just feel like it, it's not really the best site um, for this with the development going on in the community with the traffic. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of just a, like a nestled community thing. Um, I would like to see the school taken down and it left the open space. I think that was kind of a lot of what they had on the, the graphs um, that they did. 38%, if there's anything in particular you think the town should consider in redeveloping the site, open space, trees, woods. 27% services, police, fire, schools. You know, it is going to draw on the services too um, because it's, it's housing. Um, I'm wondering, you know, we talked about getting the school demolished and how we pay for that. I don't know if there's funding out there for, you know, developing open space, developing green space. I see that sometimes um, yeah, online or in the newspaper, um, and that would, might be something to look into also um, to see if we could get help with the cost of that. Um, I also know the development going in down the street, and this is just my brain and the way it works, they have no recreational space the one going in by the train station. They're, I've been going to all those meetings now for a couple of years, and those residents are gonna have you know, n no park, no green space there. 
I mean, maybe that developer would be willing to do something to help us out with something with the school to help out their their residents. Just you know, I've heard of, of the you know friendly forty bees where they'll do something to help the town. You know, so well, that hasn't been the most friendly. It has not forth. been. It has not been the most. Maybe friendly. if we started off with that instead. Of I know. I know. And I know we. I were, think we kind of handled that. We were even trying to we find were. sidewalks. You know, but hey. You, now you, we're stuck with twice as many apartments ex and forty. Exa feet. Exactly. But and you know, you know it. You you know, it's, it, it's an idea. I mean, I'm just trying to come up with ideas and stuff. But um, like I said, um, I, I think you know there's other options too. Um, there's there's land behind Char Ave, and there's land on Glenavich Way that that you know is owned and by the senior housing complexes. That might also be something that can be developed into senior housing down the line. That would be another you know. Just trying to find, you know, I'd like to come up with solutions when, you know, when I have an idea. So, just putting it out there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, I think we need to look at all these ideas, and um, I mean, we can certainly look and see if there is any funding to create open space there. Um, I don't know. Once we got our open space plan. Yeah. Um, again, that's a uh, for another subject. But yeah, we are working on. Uh, a grant that will help us get the open space plan updated and that will make us avail um, eligible for further grant money that can go into trails and and rehabbing open space and I don't think it'll get us enough to tear down a building but it would be nice but um, we yeah I, I agree you know we definitely want to look at all options okay is there anything else on this subject Okay, thank you all. Moving forward, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next item is discussion and possible vote to close Island Grove from dusk to dawn. Yeah, so um, again, this is another area where the police department has been having issues. Uh, between vandalism and trespass and you know um, trying to move people along or kids along at certain hours and out of the pool area and after a discussion uh, with the fire chief and the police chief and the DPW director uh, we, we feel it, it would be in our best interest to close from dusk till dawn at Island Grove and this would allow them to um, but just make sure that there's nobody in the area at all. The way it is right now, you're just not allowed to use the pool, but if you go in there and they step out of the pool, they're no longer in any sort of violation. It'd be better to be able to just clear them um, and clear everybody out of there at night. What would we do for like events that are held at night in there or that go into the night? I mean, there have been some events here where we do a special permit. Well, the like larger uh, events, we have a we already set up a um, a procedure where they would uh, go to the rec and or this board for larger events. Uh, so I think that we would be able to do that and approve like the, it. The not so scary woods, the movie nights. Well, certainly town sanctioned breaks, events. We would allow. Boy Scout campos. I mean, there's a, a bunch of things. I'm just they, saying. They do class reunions would, down at the cabin. Yeah. Would it be what? all <laughs> special permit? I mean, for any. I think they would all have to get permission from the rec department, and again from a certain size over, um, and I, I can't believe, I think we established it at 25 or 50, then they also had to come to this board for approval. The people that are in there, they're doing the bad thing, so they're not, they're not gonna look at the sign and say, oh, I'm gonna vandalize someplace. But so it's, gonna make it, it's gonna make I just, it. I understand, if I, it stopped me if I'm wrong, what you're gonna get at is that, well now, just if anybody's in there, yeah. we can kick them out. Yeah, well, you're, you're kicking out the people that use the park for yeah. good, but most parts and the are bad ones are still dawn. going Dane's in there. Dust till dawn. You're just mm -hmm. going to increase calls because now Miss yeah. Karen on the street is going to see. I saw somebody walking in the park and now you got to go, not you, but the police got to go check it out. So they go in and they say, get out. Right. So <laughs> but it's, it's easier than, the service. but it's easier Meanwhile, than going, it's a, are they at the pond, are they at there, they shouldn't be anywhere. I mean, we have cameras in there, right? Yep. I mean, the cameras are monitored by the police department. It, well, it's pretty difficult for them to monitor monitor that camera. Well, I mean, is, is Holbrook all right? And what I mean, 
watch. Some, someone's no, watching. They're like, monitored at the station. You know, if we're not there's other activities going on there. Where we could monitor cameras. I mean, I think Park and Rec maybe has monitors on the cam. I mean, someone has access to cameras. Park and Rec is not going to be monitoring them at night, though. That's the but problem. I'm saying there's, the there's expanded. Going on. Someone has to monitor them. They're not. Nobody is sitting and staring at a screen all night long. Yeah. I mean, just watching. That? I'm saying, I mean, down at dispatch, there's not cameras there. There's not. They are, but there's I mean, there's so there. Screen in the background. Yeah. And if you look up, you see what's going on. But then you're back to doing your. And I'm sure they also yeah, there's like, cameras that are. There's like 13 cameras of police throughout the station yeah. also. Yeah. And yeah. Um, we're, you know, and we're seeing this, and again, um, you know, we're, yeah, I, we're putting cameras in other places I too to try and knock it down. I, I've, <laughs> I mean, if you're in a central control, if you're in a dispatch, I mean, you can multitask. I mean, <laughs> we do it at the jail. I don't see any difference here. I mean, it's we have 600 cameras. I mean, is there 600 cameras in Abington? I mean, there's a camera. How many cameras in Island Grove? Five or six, seven? Okay. I mean, seven cameras on a on a monitor is not that hard. I mean, you're not staring at it the whole time, but it, I mean, if you can take a glance, you can look. I mean, oh, yeah, and you may glance up and find the picnic tables are already on fire. Maybe the picnic tables are chained or moved. I don't know. You know. So. Okay. So what do you want to do? Is this even us or park and rec? Then? No, this is you. Sets the hours. Yeah, definitely you. What's park and rec's recommendation? To close. Close to close the special did permit. Did, did they vote the, on that? Do you know the number of the vote? I don't know. Well, go ahead. Like, no. somebody of us. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Danny Howland, 36 Wilson Place. I live right beside the foot of the bridge. And I've called the police before, like at 2.30 in the morning, when there have been kids out there like coyotes howling. And it takes a while to get anything done. But apparently there's an app that goes on their phones. If you ever saw the Christmas, uh, uh, yeah, one of the Christmas uh, events there where um, Ralph says the old man can change your fuse faster than a rabbit going on a date. Well, that's how those kids took off. You call the police department, they send out something, the police go out, gone. kids are gone. They're down the street. My neighbors called too when the parking was there. And the booming is going on in the base with their, in their trunks, you can feel the houses vibrate. They may not be able to hear it, but we hear it. And in the park, there are seven cameras. Park and Rec has one, the television down there in the office, and they're in the police <coughs> station. But yes, you have to look at them. And many times at nighttime, there have been people over there causing all kinds of noise. That's why the abolitionists spoke at the point and why we had band concerts over there because the sound travels across the water. You can hear it all around. But they can't hear it in the police station because you can't, there's no, no microphones to put it in there. So I would say to do that. At, back in the 50s and 60s, there used to be signs up at the foot of the bridge and at the other side of the park that said park closes at 9 o'clock. So there's something to enforce but you have to enforce it. That's been the problem, enforcement. There are signs up there for no this, no that. When the lifeguards aren't there, you're trespassing. You have to enforce it. The same way with no smoking, no dogs off the leashes, you have to enforce it. Are we, are we closing the bridge as well? I guess I mean, that would be the access. I, I mean, if we're closing the park, we should close the bridge. I mean, that's kind of... <coughs> I mean, you're going to have someone. Yeah, I mean, you're going to have Most someone sit parks, there, and as soon as they walk up the stairs from the other side of the bridge, you're going to yell them to stop, and then call. We're the not going to have anyone sit there. But, but you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I mean, we'd have to close the bridge, and would it be a gate we'd be putting across there? Would we just put in signs up? It's and not too bad if people up. know how to keep their mouths down. But there are yeah. times when they, some of them come in with their portable Wi-Fi amplifiers yeah, and the music on travels, wheels, yeah. and they've had them on the bridge before too. Yeah. And this is after I'd say hours. that's just as much of a nuisance, right? Yes. And last night at 11.30, a motorcycle was at the foot of the bridge revving it up, and the lights were shining right down my driveway, so my bedroom's lit up, the camera comes on, and then they go making the noise down the street. Yeah. And there's a white Honda with a, one of those things in the back 
that likes to do a similar thing, make the noise around there, go down Washington Street and go by the police station with his noisy muffler. Do we have all parks in town closed, dust or dawn? No, the recommendation was only for this. But I mean, it should, be, should we be... No. I mean, if Ames Knoll is, before, it is dawn to dusk. so should we be making Knoll. every park? I mean, putting signs at every park. If we're no, I, I asked, and uh, the chiefs, the two chiefs and DPW director were with me, and the decision was that it was most important to do Island Grove. There was no issue at this time with the other parks. Okay. That's good to know. Over in Park Ave, they do have a sign on the south side of the park that says no parking after 1.30, but it shouldn't be 1.30, it should be earlier. They never put a sign up where the parking was on Lake Street. <coughs> Had they done that, then there would have been a little bit more chance of enforcing it. As it is now, people come in and park, now they park between the poles on the opposite direction. Also on Wilson Place, it's a narrow street, there's only parking on one side. And there's one sign that says no parking. I had to put park, no parking signs up on either side of the driveway because people were parking right into the driveway. And also parking from the fire hydrant, so I put tape out on the curb to indicate 10 feet either side of it because people park the wrong direction on the street, so you can't see the no parking sign. I mean, but I, it needs to be enforced, too. I mean, I would be looking at doing it across the board, every park, if we're going to do it. I mean, I don't think we just pick one. I think if it goes across for every park, put signage up at every park, and we close every park, dust it on. Is that your motion? Yes, that'll be my motion. I think that's just going to add a crazy amount of nuisance calls. Uh, I agree. And, and, and not keep the people out that you're intending to keep out. Well, I think we should go with the recommendation of the police, fire, and DPW director. Yes, Chief. <laughs> yes, you are. I thought this was going to be a fun night. Um, I just want to preface this. I don't like closing any box at, at night because it's it just, you know, for the, from the actions of a few people. Um, I, I really don't like that. However, I do agree with the police. They're having all these issues. Personally, I have been to a drowning at the pool after hours at that park. Um, that's the main reason. I'm, I'm personally just limiting this to Island Grove, mainly because of a water hazard as well as we're having some fires there as well that we're, we're actually finding out about it after the fact. Sometimes we don't always get reported all the fires until later on. So um, as for trying to monitor cameras, I don't know. I think that may enter the town into some severe liability if anything happens. The cameras, I think, now are there to kind of, you know, you can almost scroll back or whatever, but I don't know if that's... Do you may be entering into liability if, if something goes on. Why didn't you catch that? It's the camera. Do we have motion uh -huh. lights or anything there? I mean, it sounds like the, the, the pool is the, the main issue here. I mean, well, do we have motion lights around it? Do we have any sort of well, no, fencing? Well, so issues on the bridge as well. There's no motion lights there. Yeah. I mean, that would be another great thing to add as a motion light comes on. And, and if, if they're somewhat semi-monitoring cameras, yeah. I mean, that's a night and day that pops right on. Even then, I think the drowning we had back then, I think that was still in daylight. Was it? Okay. Unfortunate. But yeah. like, so say we you said that was during daylight? I think it was still light enough. I don't think it well, was, was daylight. I, I personally yeah, don't, the, don't the necessarily think you need to close all point. of the parks. Maybe if you start with this one, you know, but if we start closing well, Green Street gets a lot of activity. I think Arnold Park, it's, you know, unless there's complaints or something changes. And I, I agree, I, but the problem is I don't want to close any of them, but now we close Island Grove and now. Well, next, well due to the hazards of the specific week, Island Grove. Next week we'll have Green Street in here, and the following week well, we'll have Arnold Park, and then the next week. I, know, I, feel, I feel bad for the guy that works 12 to 8 and comes home and wants to take his dog for a walk through the Island Grove. Mm -hmm. It still likes it at 9, 10 o'clock at night, even though it's dark out. That's the, okay. that's the guy that's not going to do it because they're closed. The kids that are going in there and drinking or going in there and letting picnic tables on fire. Whatever. I mean, I think that's more of just... A sign that says they're closed, not... Well, I, the, the point is, the, point the is sign that. at that point, now they're trespassing. Right. So, so they're not, up until that point, so if they're not in the pool, they're, they're not trespassing. It, but, so now we're going to have to go respond to the guy who's walking. Who's Which is the same thing for the first, the resident walking through there. They're trespassing now, too. Because so it's closed, So if we're doing one for this person, we have to do it for all. I mean, yeah. that's... It's just an added, it's added calls. And, and, the, and the chief is right on saying there's a, the liability on the town here if anything happens on that property. 
I think liability is on the town regardless. Well, yeah, he was talking <laughs> about the cameras. Yeah, I mean, I get, yeah, I get that. I mean, we have cameras there, so it's there's yeah, no the cameras difference there. there. We have okay, cameras so there, there's, there is a motion on the floor. What's the motion? Yeah. So I'm gonna um, I'm taking my motion back. You can't. I can't take my motion. <laughs> There was no second. Uh, is there a motion on this subject, or do you want to bring the police chief and DPW in, Park and Rec? I would send this back to Park and Rec and, and have them look at it further. And send them the and do what with it when they look at it further when they already decided they want to close. I mean, they decided they want an Island Grove. I mean, I think they did Park and Rec look at all parks, so they look at just Island Grove. I don't know. If that's the case, then okay, then don't send it back. We'll do whatever you'd like. Would you like it to go back to Park and Rec and discuss all the parks? Well, I mean, if, if you're... Or else, I think that will d delay if, the issue. If you're saying Park and Rec has already looked at this, then no. I guess there's no need to send it back to Park and Rec. No. We're here tonight. If we send it back, then our next meeting is until, what, mid-July? Yep. <laughs> and then they can't make that one, let's say. So now you're talking August and August, summer's over. And now summer's do we, over. Do we have so any would staff? someone like to make a motion? Do we have any staff? Or do you want to pass to over this? Or an island group? Well, I think he's asking for it, so I would imagine that there's enough issue there yeah. for him to be asking. He brought it up. The, okay. the police chief yeah. brought I, it up. So yeah. I tend to go with uh, professionals. I'll make a motion that we'll start with this one. I'll make a motion that we close all parks in the town of Abington from dusk, dusk till dawn. Is there a second? Tim, second for discussion. <laughs> no, we discussed. <laughs> Second. No second. Is there another motion? So I'll make a motion that we close Island Grove from dusk till dawn. Is there a second on that? I'll second that. Is there any more discussion? All I'm going to say is if, if the police chief and the fire chief and the important people in town are asking for this. I take offense to that. Are we important? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. No. Motion passes. I'd still like to see statistics on that, though. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll get I mean, that for you. We have hundreds of calls that we're bogged down at Island Grove. or. Okay, discussion on it. Selectman Handbook requiring registered voters. Scott, you want to tell us why that's on here? Um, so, yeah, after we had made some of the um, changes, we did ask Town Council to opine. Uh, specifically on on that one, I think some of the other ones we said we kind of knew we wanted charter review and or bylaw review to look at. Um, this one, town council suggests it, or he suggests he said he specifically says that it has to be done either through a bylaw or through um, a charter. It's not something that can be done just as a policy um, in the selectman policy. So. My recommendation would be is we just forward it along to charter review and or bylaw review. Was that before or after I asked the last last meeting if we had talked to town council about it? It was after. We got the after. answer and after. Told, and I was told yes. I and I did not lie. We did ask town council to look at it. Yeah. And you said they had no problem with it. I never said that. Let's look at the minutes. So <laughs> um, <laughs> so do we need a motion to well, I think the motion should be to remove that from the selectman policy. Yeah, I think you know the the, the action that you took actually has no effect because it couldn't be taken it's not legally in this. So there's right. no, no action so, needed. I, I think unless you maybe know maybe if you're looking for a recommendation to send it to to try to review as part of our recommendations that we already sent over. Yeah. So no action needed. No, nope, I think we're good. And we, we actually didn't, I don't think we identified or followed up on it. Okay. Um, vote to allow Harbor to the Bay Bicycle Charity Ride through Abington. There's nobody here for that, correct? Are we doing the landfill thing tonight? Or? Yes, but yeah, he's, he's going to. He's patiently waiting. He's, uh, <laughs> he's waiting. Okay. <laughs> Just make sure I didn't miss something. 
So I think we just need a motion to allow them to ride through Abington. They've done this before. Do yeah. Do need any police details or anything like that? They'll, yeah, they'll work. Um, I'll ask them to, you know, review it with fire chief, police chief, DPW, make sure anything that we need to do. Um, but it sounds like that this is something that's been, I know they went through Whitman too, and it's just kind of a status quo. Okay. I'll make a motion to allow the harbor to the Bay Site Bicycle Charity ride through Abington. Is there a second? Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Um, I guess we might as well do see right now. <laughs> Since that's all that's left. <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> Discussion with Steve Wright, Sanborn Head Landfill Consultant. You want to use my laptop? Do you want to? Uh, whatever you think is the easiest. I can use yours. Steve, how many years you've been working on this, uh, the town? I've been with the town. Uh, since 2005. So I'm going to show some pictures of me back then. And my hair was still as thin as it is now. And I was thinner then, so. Yeah. Get this video around. You're going to have this Uh, don't tell, tell me you don't have a, uh, it's a oh. plenty of fish. What's that? Um, <laughs> so that means I should set it up on mine. Yep. <laughs> Everybody take five, get yourself a glass of water. password it's skynet Okay. 
on the town manager for the one who said no. You got one who said five minute break. Put some What? What we think we don't want to do. You taking the missus? Is that? <laughs> yeah, really. Why is Did he? Did you what? take away his PlayStation or something? What's the matter? They, they, they have a clicker. They can change. The it's probably stuck it's between the cushions. Yeah. <laughs> I'll walk in my kitchen. We watch the video. Hopefully, I'm about to get ninja. <laughs> Okay, this close. Um, you ready to know what happened to Alexander? Guys needed a break. All we right, still have a ways roll. to go. <laughs> okay, Steve, introduce yourself, please. I'm Steve Wright with Sanborn Head, uh, principal engineer, VP at Sanborn Head. And um, as Alex had asked, how long have I been like, working on the landfill? Uh, it goes back to 2005, and it was pretty, I guess, pretty active back in those first <laughs> 2005 to, I guess you could say, up to 2014. Um, and I'm aware, through, obviously, through Scott, of what uh, the potential for putting an RFP out on the street to see if you can basically get, um, 
get the site capped with really little cost to the town. Um, so Scott asked me to take a look at that draft RFP and look again anything like that it's like well I think for the selectmen it should be cast in the light of where have we been what's out there where are you with DP right now as quiet as it has been and it's intentionally I think it's to some degree with the town so like if the DP has this in their court let's just wait till they get it out of their court and that's why it's been really pretty quiet and when I go through this you find like from 2014 things have really quieted down and we're just doing compliance monitoring so um, let me give you the agenda, and I apologize. This is a little bit like a, a drink from a fire hose. Um, but I did it so that when you have your handouts, you have cheat sheets when I'm gone to kind of look at, well, what did he say anyway? What is this all about? So the items I want to talk to is an existing administrative consent order that um, neg negotiations began for the landfill back in 2005, and this would kick things off uh, with DEP and obligations relative to the site. Um, and then that it, shortly following the start of those ACO negotiations we started looking at conceptual closure alternatives of which contaminated soils to defray the cost of closure was looked at at that time um, and that was because there was a lot of pressure on the town from DEP to get ready to cap and it was happening very quickly faster than you really could get through the assessment and closure process so the town's like if this is coming at us this fast, we need to figure out a way to be able to fund it. And so the contaminated soils and the DEP has a policy about that was an obvious alternative to look at. So I'm going to present, I'm going to walk you back to the, the meetings we had, public meetings we had back in 2006, 2007 that looked at those um, alternatives. And then what is the landfill assessment and closure process? Because that was a big chunk, that was what the ACO was all about. You got to assess the landfill, you got to close the landfill. Um, and then with that is the context in the background. So how does that inform the, R the draft RFP and where the town might want to go? So that's the agenda and I will move you through this as, as quickly as I can. Um, and push me along if I'm not moving fast enough. So what prompted the ACO? Uh, there was the, you guys are all familiar with the Cape Cod Lumber side of the site, which was the old T2, I think, and Newcomb property, uh, which was a large property. But then there was also small development on the other eastern side of the site, which was, at the time, Northeast Modular Homes. And one of the lots that was closest to the landfill was undeveloped. And the owner at the time wanted to develop that lot, and he had surveyors come out to the site and the surveyors are looking at the site and they're like eh, it looks like you got an issue here with the landfill coming onto your property the then owner called the DEP DEP comes out and they say yeah you got an issue here the landfill and we didn't even know much about what was going on this landfill's been off our radar screen because it hadn't been active since 1975 so you know we're talking 30 years later DEP comes out and they say oh, we got a and they had a number of meetings with the town then I got involved with my former company which was SEA um, so that started the ACO process and negotiations, which evolved over a good chunk of time. Um, but the, the, the site visit, there were two primary violations that they were citing the town at, and it was failure to cap an online landfill, and you had an unpermitted post-closure use, which is the front part of the site where you got the composting going on. And there was some small-scale recycling activities, so the DEP's like, you got to address those, we got to deal with it through the ACO. Now, the ACO wasn't finalized until 2010, and in large part, what added to that, there was the normal negotiations that go on between town and DEP. Uh, there were some funding considerations and funding cycles that had a factor into this, but it was largely because uh, there wasn't just an issue on the eastern small parcel of land, but there was an issue over on the old T2 golf driving range and it was a much bigger encroachment on that side. And it took time to negotiate rights of entry and be able to get onto the property. So long and short, it took, <coughs> took to 2010 to get the ACO finalized. And now the requirements of the <coughs> ACO, you gotta complete a landfill assessment uh, process, you gotta prepare a corrective action design, which is what they call it. A lot of times it basically means you gotta cap it. You gotta do a design to cap the landfill. Uh, and then you gotta implement it, you gotta construct it. And then the, so in terms of compliance status right now, the ACO only had one date 
that is fixed calendar date in it. And it was the submittal was called the Comprehensive Site Assessment Report. So it's one of the biggest pieces of the assessment process, one of the most costly pieces. And that had to be submitted, well, it was submitted in 2014. Um, other than that, the ball is in DEP's court because all of the timelines in the ACO is we will DEP, the town will do something within so many days of DEP reviewing and approving of something. Well, they've had the CSA, they haven't done anything with it. So it's, that's why the ACO, it's active, but it's no trigger right now, it's just kind of like dormant. Um, so now what the site looks like and what are the issues at the site? So north is point, pointing, obviously you can see it's to the left-hand side. And uh, here's what we got. That's our site <coughs> currently, the, the property limits, tw about 21 acres. Uh, these colors don't show very well here. It's not a good contrast, but you might sort of see, and maybe your handouts are better, where our landfill is, the delineated limits, that's part of the CSA activities test pitting out there. It's a, uh, 11 and a half acres, I call it about 12, rounding it off. And that's the encroachment on the former Northeast Modular Homes property. And the town acquired that property in 2011. There's about a third of an acre that went onto his property of a one acre parcel. The bigger parcel was, was the, uh, like I say, the old Newcomb parcel. And as part of Cape Cod Lumber acquiring the, par the property, Newcomb had an agreement with the town that says, if I can sell this property, I'll make sure that the chunk of the landfill that's on my property gets turned over to the town. And it was all wrapped into the Cape Cod Lumber <coughs> transaction, so they weren't buying that headache. And that was about a five acre um, uh, acquisition or turnover to the town. And that was in 2012. So town owns all those parcels now. And I think, I don't know what else turned on there. I think it, the, the gray area where the composting is turns on. That's what that was, um, which we had to do some ambient air monitoring in that area. That whitish highlight along the perimeter is um, the results of test pits to the extent we could do them is in wetland area. And that's what we're estimating as wetland encroachment. It's 1.6 acres. That's a fair amount of wetland encroachment. Um, but it's, it's also estimated to be conservative. And that's probably one of the bigger issues when the time comes to have to deal with the, the closure of the landfill. Because um, environmentally, the landfill is not really indicating much impact. So uh, now, what did we do for conceptual closure alternatives? Again, the ACO was issued, in, well, not issued, but the drafts began in 2005, back and forth. Pressure, you got to close. Town's like, all right, what are we going to do? Let's look at alternatives. And it was looking at several alternatives that had post-closure use, um, no post-closure use, let's import some soil, let's not import any soil. But the big driver was, what can we get for revenue out of the soil? How can we compare this to other alternatives if we don't import the soil? And get a feel for a comparison of costs and how we should proceed. Now, MassDEP has a policy for importing contaminated soils at unlined landfill sites. And so when we were looking at alternatives for the town, we were trying to do it under the guise of that, of that, or the premise of that policy. And um, they, it does allow you to bring in different types of materials, not just contaminated soils. So it allows you to bring in C and D residuals. That's another material you can bring in, street sweepings, catch basin cleanings. But most often what you see uh, communities taking in are, are soils, and there's such a demand to you know, find a home for impacted soils now. Uh, so anyway, that was, well, I'll speak to that, but that was the premise for what was presented. We were, the town would, would bring in soils, not any other type of material, but it was going to be soils. Um, and then ACOs as part of the DEP policy. It's, it's an administrative consent order that the DEP uses to memorialize the agreement between the town and DEP of how you're going to bring that material in, in a timeline. And since you already have an ACO, if you go this path, the assumption would be uh, that they'd modify the ACO to fold this into it. I suppose it's possible that they could say, well, let's close the old ACO and do a new one. I, I'm not sure they would do that. And another big part, I just clicked the head, but another big part of the <coughs> guidance uh, policy from MassDEP is to have a public comment period. 
to allow the public to, to weigh in and present this to the, to the public so that they can weigh in on what they think of post-closure uses, the material that's coming in, how it's going to come in, what it means to them, particularly people that are close to the site. So the alternatives that were evaluated and an alternative that was selected. So we had three meetings back in 2006. We had two uh, in September and December, and then we had a closing meeting, and they were joint meetings, Board of Health, Board of Selectmen. Uh, the closing one and the final decision on what to, to, to do as a, a preferred option was January 8th in 2007. And we looked at nine options, uh, and they were, you know, 50,000 foot level uh, to get an idea of how they each compared. So uh, this is in, in, a, in a box or a matrix format. We looked at them in the context of what if you maximize the amount of soil you could bring into the site versus an intermediate amount of soil versus no soil import. And, and then um, compare, as part of the matrix, you'd say, well, for those three alternatives, what if you had no post-closure use, you had a partial post-closure use, or you had a full post-closure use? And there's your nine options, and graphically, um, they fill in like this. And this is exactly the graphic with the numbers that was presented back in 2006, 2007. And the numbers, I was mentioning to Scott, the numbers were conservative at the time, and I think for closure costs are still pretty good, because at the time, not as high as it is now, but we were going through a spike in fuel costs back at that time, and I was trying to account for it, and I was jumping up numbers around that time. So. As much as I'd say, eh, don't, don't go with these numbers, they're not bad numbers for a capping cost. So you can see we got ball fields. We, and, and this was all part of the town saying, well, let's just throw some different things out there. But the alternatives that are imp importing soil are um, like maximizing a soil importer, like one, two, and three. And that was, a, you know, you're looking at about, in alternative one, it was over 150,000 cubic yards. And then the intermediate import was like 85,000 cubic yards. So that's like four, five, and six. And then seven, eight, nine was no import. So we presented those alternatives. If you look at alternative number three, because that's the one that was selected, there was maximizing the fill in the back part of the site with, with soil. And I'll just flip to that so you can see it a little bit better. Um, <clears throat> maximizing soil in the back part of the site no real soil import in the front part of the site. Reserve that for a compo continued composting and some recycling activities. And this is just, again, conceptual. There's nothing really vetted in that concept other than we're going to have a pavement area in the front part of the site. That front part of the site is about four acres. The back part of the site is about eight acres. And that big brown area there, at the time this was done, we hadn't done the test pitting on the Newcomb property. So we didn't really, I could tell walking the site what it looked like the limits of the landfill were. And we were trying to be conservative here and saying, don't assume you can pull the landfill out into that brown area because it looks like that's clean, but we haven't done test pits yet. And for the most part, it, was, it is clean. That area there doesn't have anything in it. So these estimates of 150,000 cubic yards, you can see in the profile, it's a pretty significant raise in grade on the back part of the site. And the only reason you see a raise in the grade in the front part of the site, it's part of the regrading of the front part using existing material. Um, so that's option three, and it was option three that was voted on and, and um, in the record, if you will, it, between that joint meeting, Board of Select and Board of Health, and we'd have the public here, and we spoke about how the material, the concept of how the material would be imported. And then the town manager advised DEP, hey, we have this in-concept approach that we're going to move forward with, and so we had that kind of resolved as a direction. The only thing that wasn't resolved at the time is we couldn't do anything because we didn't have the property. So it's like, well, when we get that resolved. So that's what we looked at back in the day on the alternatives. Now landfill assessment and closure. So what's that all about? So the landfill assessment and closure process is a multi-stepped uh, regulated process with DEP where you can't move to the next step until the DEP approves of the prior step and the scoping that you do in that prior step for the next step. So it begins with an initial site assessment and we did that and, and a big part of that was test pitting to find out where is the limit of waste. That was submitted in September of 2008. It was approved by DEP shortly thereafter, to December 2008. It approved our scope for the comprehensive site assessment, field investigations and report. 
which like I said is the probably the most costly part of the assessment process because you're gathering all this environmental data putting in wells and landfill gas sampling surface water sampling groundwater sampling uh, and then evaluating it so we submitted that in 2014 and again that was the deadline or the date in in the ACO we asked for extension but that and DP granted us that and now it's just been sitting there and they haven't acted on it and I've met with the board in 2012 as we were doing the CSA 2014 after we submitted the CSA with the idea like okay now we got to get ready because they're gonna act on this and they didn't act on it and then I have some conversations with with Rick over following maybe even years uh, let's not push this there's no reason to push it when they get around to it they'll get around. you guys had other costs that you had to deal with big projects the school things like that so all right so we just let it lie and um, and yet there are other steps in the process so if the DEP came back and said hey here's your approved CSA and the CSA has the shell of a scope of work for the next step which is an alternatives analysis and the alternatives analysis can look at all those alternatives that I just presented uh, that we looked at back in 2006 or something different and they were sort of shelled out around that concept of uh, not that many alternatives but solar was another thing we just you're just putting placeholders there and then if the D when the DP comes back and, and approves our CSA we'd come back to the town and say okay what do we want to really look at for alternatives how many of these do you guys think are still valid uh, if any of them so and I, th I know one of them I think that the board was always thought was the most valid which was the no action alternative which we're allowed to look at so um, so that gets into but but let me talk of, so then there's the CAAA and then when you uh, select a preferred alternative you submit you know you have a report that goes into DEP and if the DEP approves of what you're proposing that's your approval to do a corrective action design which is your generally your cap design and that's a corrective action design you get that approved and then you can go out to construction and that's the traditional assessment and closure process so we're back at the CSA phase but again a lot of cost in this process certainly between ISA CSA and CAAA the biggest nut in that was the CSA the town's past that so oh, I'm sorry so now the CSA findings groundwater and I, I bolded it here minimal impact on groundwater surface water some impact on stream surface water where the impact may be elevated further from the landfill and the monitoring we've done since then it kind of dances around but it's it's still not like alarming yeah so some impact stream sediment so that's the stream that there's a stream that crosses through the midsection of the landfill that divides the front from the back um, again some impact there from an eco risk perspective and those standards are very low but still nothing alarming uh, wetland soil we had to do some soil sampling from the frag mighty in that the extended area that I showed you uh, the white zones around the landfill and there was some metals hit but not again not alarming not no, no sort of smoking anything so and landfill gas we have to look at landfill gas for off-site migration and <coughs> since you're surrounded by wetlands there's no real off migration the water binds it keeps it confined the landfill doesn't generate a lot of gas the back part has some gas that it generates and we look in one corner of the site which you'll see here so here's our monitoring network It's a small network we got four wells that <coughs> ring around the landfill uh, here's where the sediment and surface water collection points were in the stream that crosses uh, the landfill um, and let's see if I can see this and then the GMW's that's gas monitoring well one and two which were installed within the landfill and then this blow up here is just gas wells perimeter wells that were put down in that that corner of the site because that if there was off-site migration that's where there's receptor potential receptors and we don't have gas hits we have gas in the back part of the landfill but it just tells us that the landfill is generating gas um, if there was a post closure use back there it might be it be helpful to know that but it's not problematic so uh, the CSA recommendations what did we recommend there are two major recommendations that came out of it what is what should be the mon environmental monitoring program with the CSA being done and essentially that's what we're doing right now it's this uh, 
routine monitoring at the landfill that we've been doing groundwater and, and surface water and um, sediment and landfill gas. And then we had these suggested corrective action alternatives to be evaluated during the CAAA phase. So I mentioned we're doing the ongoing monitoring um, and we've been doing it since 2014. Corrective action alternative analysis, the concepts that were presented. So because the landfill last operated in 1975, the potential that you could maybe get a grandfather to standards at that time, which would be like a two foot of soil cover, no plastic cap, it's a possibility. So it's an alternative that we, we speak to. And if you want to do compost operations in the front part of the site, you know, maybe just pave it or dense grade it. And you're not doing anything overly like landfill capping oriented. You're just trying to put a barrier layer in there and improve it and minimize access to the, to the waste material and make it more maintainable so there's not, it's not all overgrown. That's the, the grandfathered part, the first bullet point there in the absence of an approved cap, which you don't have an approved cap. The, the, the high-end alternative is capping to the standards that exist today, which is a drainage material, a topsoil material, you got a bedding material, and you have a geomembrane. Um, so that's the most costly alternative. And then we have a no-action alternative. So, the, so these are what are allowed under the regs. Do a standard, do a no-action, do a standard, and then you can look at an alternative. So those are the three basic. And then we took the presentation that we had back in 2006, 2007, and what the town voted on, and we weaved in concepts for bringing in impacted soils. And we were just reminding DEP, hey, the town voted on this, and we want to keep it in front of you. Um, so, and I th that, so the third bullet here says, uh, weave in a no action alternative for the wetlands. Because the wetlands really com does complicate things for us. If we have to cap and deal with those, it, it just the, the quantity of wetland impact uh, has a, a certain permitting requirement to it that I won't bore you with, but it gets involved. So, um, I mean, if you think what keeps it not so involved, if you have less than 5,000 square feet of wetland impact, and we have 60,000 based upon these estimates. So keep that in mind. And, and I think that it's, you could advocate that you not have to deal with that. Now, this is definitely the, the, a drink from a fire hose, and it's also hard to see. But if you look at item four here, and if you look at your handout, this has the 150,000 cubic yards. This is the option that was voted on and improved in concept to say 150,000 yards of contaminated soil in the back part of the site, and then we're going to do a post-closure use in the front part of the site. Um, that's, I think that's the alternative that I wanted to point out to you. But there is a no-action alternative here. What if we don't do anything and we justify that based upon is there really enough impact out here? Could we actually, or do a minimal um, corrective action? So these are, all, these are the alternatives that are in concept in front of DEP as part of the CSA report, shelling out the next step, the alternatives analysis. So now here we are, considerations for going forward. The draft RFP, uh, which you guys probably know, the, the items that are included in there, the requested services, closure design, uh, community outreach, construction and construction observation, continued composting and recycling drop-off during the project, and completion of upgrades to the composting recycling area upon completion of the closure. So if this is turnkey, the idea is, I guess, at the end of the project, not only will you have it all capped, but you'll have a nice area out in the front for people to do drop off, um, all baked into the, the turnkey nature of this. So now considerations um, regarding the draft. So that draft RFP operates in a little bit of different manner than what was anticipated or thought about back in 2006, 2007, and that's okay. But just so you know, back in the day, the idea was the town will bid, um, and you could do it one of two ways, but you could bid out the soils uh, importation to a contractor. You put a, a set of bid documents together, put it on the street, a contractor bids on it, and it may be the same contractor that would cap the landfill. 
he operates it for you and he's bringing in dirt and he's placing the dirt in accordance with design plans and controls, including making sure the soil packages are okay and all that, which is, so if you've got contaminated soils, there's a whole procedure related to that. And so you've got your controls on that and that's one contractor and it could be the same contractor, that's your revenue stage, and you're bringing revenue in as the dirt's coming in. And it could be the same contractor that then flips and caps the site. But that he had to bid that and win that work and that the town would be paying that. So the town's still staying in that kind of role as managing through the engineer um, that process. The draft RFP is not unusual. You know, there are other ones that are like this that are out on the street. Just turnkey it and turn it over. So a couple of points to keep in mind, though, with, with the idea of the town bidding it through, uh, you know, engineering, um, d doing engineering design and then bidding at 3039M, is that the landfill does have peat underneath it. And uh, peat is compressible. Now, some of that's going to have been compressed because of some of the waste material that's out there. But generally on these uh, dirt fill sites, airspace, when you turn, when you turn key it, you don't really own the airspace anymore because the contractor's coming in and he's like, I'm making my assumptions on, hey, this is what I got for, a, for an existing conditions on the surface, and I'm filling to here, and, and this is my airspace, and I gotta get enough dirt, I gotta get enough airspace to be able to offset my, my costs for capping this thing. Now, if you have compressible material, whether it's the waste mass itself, which it would be, and maybe underlying peat material, that top surface, when he starts loading it, is going down. So the airspace is increasing because you're surcharging it. And there is revenue there. And boy, it can be a great pickup. It's like, wow, we, we estimated this thing on so many yards, 100, let's, let's call it 150,000 yards. And we figured it was gonna take this amount of time to, to, to bring in that amount of material. But the, the, the landfill is just, it's compressing, and we're able to bring in, I don't know, 30% more, let's just say. The only thing you might see as a result of that is, and it's taken longer to kind of reach the grades, but that airspace potentially is owned by the contractor, so that's great for him. Um, and, and you can work that through to your interest, too, as long as you're aware of it, at least I think you can. Um, but under the original concept, you would have owned the airspace. So if you found that to be the case, it's like, geez, we're bringing in more. We're, that money's going straight to us. The only thing that gets, gets sliced off the top is the cost to pay the contractor to scale it, like if he's going to put a scale out there. So you've got to pay him to do that, and you've got to pay him to place it. So there's cost there. And I can tell you, on a landfill project um, recently, we had, on average, and it was a, it was a good-sized soils project, Maybe it was about $17 a ton on average. And you'd get these variabilities on it, depending upon what was happening in the marketplace uh, and what was going on near Boston and how, how limited disposal was near Boston, because this wasn't right near Boston. Um, so about, you know, it was around $17 a ton, and it was maybe $5 a ton to manage it, to, to scale it and place it. And those are much better numbers. Um, than what we were thinking of in 2007. We were going off at 10 bucks a yard. And those numbers that I just said to you, net, are probably about 20 bucks a yard. So if your closure costs don't change too much and your revenue's coming, that's great. And if you're getting more airspace because it's compressing, that's, that's even better. It's like, oh my God, we might actually be able to build a baseball field too. <laughs> you know, it's like, so, so that's an important thing to, think about though the settlement issue is um, is a value to the town uh, to keep in mind so uh, getting back to some considerations here because uh, I just went through the first three small bullets indented bullets there I think um, the potential for a no action alternative at the site this is an option that was intended to be explored with mass DEP as part of the CAAA uh, if composting and recycling is to continue in the front part of the site some form of cap is expected to be required. So if we were able to convince DEP to, to do, keep the contaminated soils, now put that to the back and say, look, 
uh, how can we keep the cost down as much as possible? Can we get away with a no action alternative or a minimal, make it maintainable in the back? So we're gonna, we're gonna clear cut and we're gonna put some soil down. We're gonna do some minimal stuff in the back uh, to, to make it more manageable, mow it, whatever, and keep those costs down. But if we want to do something in the front part of the site, it's to be expected that the DEP is going to say you've got to do some form of protection if you're going to be digging around and moving around on the front there. So generally a post-closure use is going to mean you know, you're not going to get away with a no action if you've got some sort of post-closure connected to it. So um, what, are, what are some other thoughts on this? So now this is more directed towards the draft RFP. There's a concept sketch. This shows net fill of 163,000 cubic yards of material. And there's a couple of things that are of interest to me in that. Um, it, it seems to account, and I think properly and conservatively, for not filling in the wetlands. Um, they're not going to the same elevation that conceptually we looked at back in 2007. We were maxing out at going by elevation 195 and their proposal is 180. Um, now ours, we were comparing alternatives so it was really mostly to compare A to B to C to D or one, two, three, four. It, it wasn't drilling down and saying all right how are our contours all working? We were just maximizing. And When you get into it you know you're probably going to lose some, you're going to lose something tying into the edges or whatever. So their, their alternative um, has a total of 163,000, but they're also filling in the front part of the site. And, and that had some three to one grades in it. So, I, I, and again, they're probably, you know, just conceptually looking at things, but that may not work great in concert with composting. You know, they have this hill in there, and it's like, how are you composting on the hill? Um, and if you lost volume in the front part of the site, because it's like, well, we want to do composting here, so we've got we to gotta flatten that out. Um, how much volume do you end up losing, or would the contractor end up potentially losing and start to feel maybe differently about it? Um, and maybe you'd be okay, but that's something to, to keep in mind. Um, I think his numbers also account for, he's got a gross fill number I think, I'm not positive, but he also might be accounting for reducing because some of his final grades are assuming that those are capping grades. So you gotta strip off imported clean soils to do that. But, but that's his working numbers, best I understand it, 163. So it's pretty close to the 150 we had, it's just he's getting it from the front as well. Um, so let me just catch myself up on some of these bullets here. So what would, the, would the material be contaminated soil or other grading and shaping materials? So that's a question. Um, I think it's contaminated soils, but I'm not positive uh, that that would be the entirety of it because the material, different types of material have different things you gotta think about. And DEP has different issues with different types of material. Uh, I already mentioned the filling shown in the front part of the site that would mound that area um, that could conflict with, with post-closure use in the front area. Um, Filling is shown in an area about a half an acre. You know, I showed you that brown area on the old Newcomb property that I said this is kind of, it's not waste, and it was confirmed with the test pitting. Some of the concept grading is, is slicing through that, and it's, it's extending the landfill footprint by about a half an acre, which generally the DEP is like, you can't enlarge your footprint. So um, I don't know how problematic that would be. Because it may not sound like much, but you got this long spine, and, and if you can get your grading by taking advantage of a, a, sm a smooth sweeping out, if you lose that, it can, have, it can have a decent effect on your volume. So these were issues because these drawings are very similar to what we saw. I think they're the same ones that we saw back in 2017. And we commented on, on these, and it, it seemed at the time that that was sort of a... Uh, that's, that's uh, it's not that great. Mostly the issue of that half acre. Um, and I think it caused a sort of backing away. But things must have changed. You know, being the market what it is, it's like, well, maybe, maybe that still, maybe that alternative still works out of the gate. 
uh, I still think you have those considerations, though. That you got to you got to tackle. Um, so anyway, that gets me down to uh, what would the loss of grading and shaping capacity, if if there is, which I think there would be, due to the pro forma or the financial analysis that the contractor's done or any contractor does. Uh, what's the minimum volume needed to cover mm -hmm. cover costs uh, of capping and and whatever your post closure use area is and what you want that to be. Um, Settlement considerations, I already mentioned that to you, um, and how that can be of value to the town if you're aware of it, or potentially could be. Uh, grading and shaping closure will trigger out. So here's what brings us to, what does this mean to us now? Grading and shaping will trigger outreach to Mass DEP. The draft RFP acknowledges all this. It, it, it understands this is, what, this is the process. And it's expected to lead to a modification to the ACO. So how will Mass DEP close out the CSA? These activities that are already in, it's gonna, it's gonna require action to say, all right, this is how we're gonna close this out. And how could we best advocate to close certain things out? Can we get away from this wetlands issue? If we could get that off the table, that's a huge, huge thing off the table. Um, how will Mass DEP close out the CSA? Where would the CAAA fit into the process? Um, would it be in the process? Does it need to be in the process? And will Mass DP require the CAAA? Uh, what about wetlands encroachment? Sorry, I already mentioned that to you. Um, let me just see what I have here. I'm not going to go on that one yet. So the CAAA, this is again the alternatives analysis. And this is where the town could use that step to confirm what it wants to do for post-closure use and how it wants to do it, what it wants the, the front to look like. And maybe it's no big deal, but um, you know, what are the concepts for that? Um, and again, r resolving or confirming how much soil you think you'd be bringing in. Um, resolve that you're not, you know, your post-closure use is really not gonna be anything in the back part of the site. Um, so you basically, if you get through the CAAA, you will have gotten through almost all of the assessment process. It would take you right up to the design. And should, you, should the town go through that step, next step, would that be in your best interest? If you're going to go back to DEP and say, this is something we're interested in doing, we're interested in bringing this material in, and we want to start talking about that and get feedback from you, Mass DEP, because you're going to be bringing in, theoretically, let's say it's, it is the contaminated soils. Well, what sort of protections does the town need to be aware of? And should there be more protections that the town should work into an RFP in, in the interest of uh, testing requirements for those soils? Now, the, there are processes for that that DEP has, testing requirements. But things are changing a little bit um, with emerging contaminants of PFAS and things like that. And that's not part of the program. And, and it might be something that you want to certainly be aware of and be proactive with DEP if you're going to talk to them and be represented about, you know, how do we protect ourselves against this? Uh, should we be aware of it? Is there an issue here? I, really, I strongly think the town needs to, if it's going to go and put an RFP out on the street before you do anything like that, that means you're ready to engage DEP because it's going to take you there. You have to go there. You better, it's better to go to them before the RFP goes out on the street, get your ducks in a row and understand what is it that they're asking because there may be pieces that should go into that RFP to, to solicit protections for you or requirements. And that's what this last bullet here says. Um, they've been silent on the CSA and the ACO uh, since 2014 and this will wake them up there may be advantages to, to talking to them because you may be able to advocate better on your own behalf when you're being proactive than waiting to hear from them. So that, that could be a benefit to you. But the question is, well, what if we did nothing? Now, this has been the thought. How long do we, how long could we do nothing? Um, when will they get around to us? And you think about it, this is eight years. This is a oh, freaking long time. <laughs> You know, um, particularly given how urgent everything was early on. And I can't make any interpretations from it. It's not like, oh, so the, the, the I think if the results from the CSA were showing something 
uh, that was alarming, it'd be different. But I wouldn't go so far as to say they don't care anymore because of the results of the CSA. It's just they got flooded with a lot of solar projects back around that time, limited staff, and I think they just had to address the urgent needs at the time, and Abington was falling at the back of the pack, and to some degree surprisingly, because ACOs are generally a high priority. Um, and and I, they're still on the list. You know, they, they, they got to close this out. So anyway, um, just to reiterate this, if you meet with them, how does the work fit in with the existing ACO? How can you present your interests? Know the, know the items that you'd want to be able to, if you can get them off the table, get the wetlands issues, agree that based upon the results of the CSA, we have some good findings. And to close, if we could close that out and get positive close out from MassDEP, you know that those issues are resolved. So when you put something out on the street, when the contractor gives you a concept that shows no wetland replication, no wetland restoration, it's because, yeah, we already got the blessing on that. We don't know where we stand with that right now. Um, so I, I hit on everything, I think. And you guys so your comments? suggestion is that we talk to or have someone like you talk to DEP on our behalf if we're going to put an RFP out. if we're yeah. going to put an RFP yeah. out. well you've yeah. already you have already voted and directed yeah. me to put an RFP together yeah. the reason I brought Stephen in was because I know you don't all have the same history and background of what's been going on at the landfill and I thought it was important that you you got up to date on it um, my thought would be exactly that though is moving forward we'll work together to go meet with DEP and just continue forward and you know just keep you guys up to date as we hit these milestones and certainly if we hit any speed my points. fear is you know I, I think there's an opportunity now to get the fill at low cost or no cost to the town ten years from now we don't know what's going to happen and if DEP all of a sudden tells us 10 years from now, okay, now we're looking at it, now close it. And these opportunities aren't out there with the construction that's going on now and everything. I think it could be millions of dollars for the town if we had to cap it. I hear what you're saying. And, and I would tell you that could be the case. Um, um, with respect to the soils disposal, unless there's a real slump, right? If they're still building, if they're still got to get rid of impacted soils, um, and the DEP does nothing to make it easier to get rid of that, uh, and they've tried to, you know, do things with quarries and similar soils, but it's that's a that's that's um, similar soils to the you know, it's not as impacted generally. Uh, this this is called COM 97 soil, so there's a little bit more of a contamination profile to it. It seems what we've seen so far from 2006 to today is less places to get rid of it because landfills are becoming scarcer and scarcer. This project I just told you about is like was a major MSW landfill and it is no more and it closed out by taking the dirt at the very last leg of its life and there are other landfills out there where you have contractors that you know they see what a what an advantage it is to have to own well not own but to be able to take material to a site that supports their construction or development right. arm and I I want to believe but I could be wrong so Alex you know that's a it's a safe way to look at it I could also be convinced to say what's twenty dollars a cubic yard today in ten years is going to be fifty dollars a cubic yard you know um, and and the capping costs are they going to climb as much because they're so driven by fuel you now hopefully gas isn't you know I don't know what's going to happen with the fuel costs I mean, geomembrane is a petroleum product um, you know, geotextiles are petroleum products, shipping is, you know, it's just the fuel costs right now. You guys see it, I'm sure. It's, it, you know, these cost provisions, you know, uh, to, to deal with fuel escalators. And, you know, who knows what it'll be like when the DP does right. come back. You know, you're right, Alex. So, so 
if you act on the basis that we know that there's a market there now, and it's a pretty good market, um, and we think we can fold in our protections and we can get the value we want out of this, and there will be some cost, let's say, to the town, but it's marginal compared to the, the, the major nut. Um, it's really a question of how you I think just how you position yourself for moving forward with that work and and in what time frame would any contractor be willing to say, yeah, I'm really interested in this and if this thing comes online in the next year, because it even the, the results of talking to DEP, you might find yourself, now you've talked to them, that process starts, and my guess is it's going to be moving again. And if it, and, and the idea would be, well, if it's moving again, this is the direction we're going to take it, and that's the direction it's going to have to go. Because if it doesn't go in that direction, why do we do this? Mm. You know? um, so it really means that there's not probably a lot of alternatives to look at because this is what we want to do. We want to maximize the soils. It's going to be in that back part of the site. We want to do this in the front part of the site. And we may have, what if, what if they adopted a no action alternative or some slice of it? It would give you an opportunity to say, all right, well, what is that value of a no action alternative or a partial no action where we do have to pay something, but we don't have to bring in dirt versus bringing in dirt and maybe even paying less? Or paying the same amount, and what do we, uh, what do we want to do? What what makes most sense for us? That may be the, the math exercise that you want to take a look at. Find out would DEP back off? How far off would they would they back off? Um, so, Any questions? Very informative. You. I know so it's a lot. You two stuff. will continue. Yeah. And yeah. You know, when we get to the next step, I'll bring it to the board again. So I was on conservation, um, as you know, when Steve started all this. Yeah. Uh, yep. A long time ago. And, um, it was a hell, right? Yeah, hell, yeah. Got yeah. yeah, me and hell. So maybe another 10 years, another town manager. Yeah. And we'll <laughs> maybe. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, I, I still have to be here until <laughs> only 55. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank, uh, thank Scott you. will thank be in touch with you. Thank you, right. Scott. I Appreciate guess it. you've got all of that you now. You've got all the secret information. Yeah, here. and I will see if I can. Okay, town manager's report. Have we done everything else? I believe we have. Oh, nice. All right, so um, Lish Shea, who was here earlier, uh, is currently working with several other communities. Uh, we're selecting a consultant to work with the, um, our towns to update our hazard mitigation plans. This work uh, was made possible through an assistance grant from FEMA. It's worth about $70,000. Uh, the plan is necessary to be available for other grants as well as financial assistant, assistance should there be you know, some sort of weather-related incident. Uh, plan identifies areas of concerns that could pose significant hazards during a storm-related event, things like dams, culverts, um, you know, problems with our facilities, et cetera. They're all reviewed for potential issues, and then, um, you know, we put together corrective action plans. Um, we, and actually, I, it, I think we're meeting tomorrow to interview the uh, two people who respond, uh, two out of the three people that responded to the RFP for that. Um, we've received several complaints regarding the practice of panhandling at the intersection of 18 and 123. Mm -hmm. I've been advised by KP Law that uh, most courts that have looked at this issue have held that panhandling is protected by the First Amendment. Um, if an individual is interfering with the flow of traffic or causing a threat to the safety of himself or others, this activity may be considered disorderly conduct. However, even in such a case, the recommendation is that the person be encouraged to move to a safer location uh, rather than requiring them to stop what they're doing or subjecting them to any sort of um, detainment. 
Town Clerk Leanne Adams has advised me that a recent change to the election laws require that effective immediately the law regarding the assignment of police officers at polling places is amended to require the Board of Selectmen, Town Council, or City Council to actually do the assigning of the police officers and or constables to the polling places. Uh, previously, this was the responsibility of the Chief of Police. Um, don't know why they made this change. I will work with Leanne, though, to establish some sort of a plan that we'll, you know, present to the board prior to the any elections and um, for your approval to assign officers as necessary. Uh, back in May, we received notice that the Federal Emergency Management Agency issued a major disaster declaration for the severe winter storm that impacted Massachusetts on the 28th and 29th of January. This makes federal disaster assistance available to us. Uh, Finance Director Andrew Nocum has been working with the DPW Police and Fire to gather uh, necessary documentation. At this point, it looks like we may be eligible for approximately $70,000 in reimbursement. On Tuesday, June 21st, representatives from Clifford and Kenny conducted a training at the Abington Senior Center. Topics covered included um, open meeting law review, review of expectations of volunteer committee and board members, how to conduct the meeting with civility and respect, de-escalation techniques for dealing with contentious meetings. Um, I'd like to thank all of the board members that did participate, um, committee welcome. members that did participate. They were, uh, I think they probably found it to be an extremely um, helpful training. And we are going to do this training again in the fall. So hopefully anybody who didn't make it at that one can make it to the fall one. Uh, we're working on year end close out preparing for the new fiscal year projects. Uh, I'm going to be meeting <coughs> the finance committee for the year end transfers uh, the week of the 15th. So I would like to schedule this board to meet on July 11th so you can review and approve the transfers as well. And that's all I have. All right. Scott, Any questions? To I, I, I actually do. <laughs> uh, I usually do. Um, regarding the. Uh, because I mentioned that at the, at the beginning of the code read, I had a couple of uh, residents reaching out to me asking some questions about it. So when we're, is what we're posting on our town Facebook page also being, is, is that part of the, the email blast that residents so, are getting? Yeah, if we put out an email blast, it, it will typically go, it, it is a bit quirky and we're still getting used to the system but it will also post on Facebook okay yeah. all right and, and vice versa or is it if we post something on Facebook it won't necessarily no it's not going to be a code red okay I hope not all right especially if you guys are <laughs> posting something oh, yeah. <laughs> tick tock of your kids yeah <laughs> but so well no because the only things we really post on the, the town Facebook page is like anything really it's usually it's something it's yeah and, and what we did get a little bit of feedback some people felt um, that maybe we overused it on that first weekend. Um, and it's quite possible because, you know, it's a new toy and oh, yeah, we wanted to make possible. sure it worked. Well, it we worked. had six phone worked, calls come in that Friday worked. because we had like three for the first one and then Sundays came out yeah. late yeah. on Friday and saying it was June 12th and that, that Ooh, celebrated. So we got some bugs out. to work out. Yeah, there's no doubt. Little <laughs> I think a lot of people probably let people know that we are working them out. And yeah. yeah. It's so I'm going to send out a code red actually right after this meeting to say that we're still working out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll wake them up at 10 o'clock, <laughs> just so you know. Is, does it specific, so like if something's going on in a, specific, uh, in a specific part of town, like say like off of Dorsey or off of Hancock, Hancock Street, would, does, does the system target specific areas or is it just general to the, the general public? So people who subscribed, I should say. Well, you have to be a subscriber. Um, however, there are people that were already subscribed from different, um, I think, through Code Red in other areas. And once you're in, you're in. Now, sometimes we may target a certain geographic area. Um, there's several ways of doing that. We could, you know, pick out several streets. We could just do a radius. Um, we can set it up for different groups. Um, or we can just send it to everybody in town. But um, I, I, 
that answer? Yeah, no, that does. Yeah, that right. answers. So, uh, like, I don't know that. I don't know that it'll go out because of some of the bugs with the system. But, for instance, tomorrow they will be paving. Um, I think you know, throughout the week, but I think tomorrow they're going to be doing the paving on Summer Street. That would probably go out to everybody if okay, so we wanted to put it out just to say, hey, be aware that there's going to be some traffic delays and Summer Street will be closed. Yeah, no, because that was one of the things that I've heard from a couple of residents that they, even if it might not be in their neighborhood, they, they were like, oh, I want to know what's going yeah. on in town. Just yeah. Well, especially like on Summer Street, it's like, okay, now I know to avoid so going by yeah. Summer Street and, tomorrow. And what, you know, in the future, and, and we just haven't sort of rolled it out with um, the water department yet, but in the future, if they're going to be doing hydrant flushing on, say, Dorsey, then we may send something out just to that general area to say, hey, look, we're going to be in the area doing hydrant flushing. You know, when you get home, run the water for a few minutes or something. Oh, okay. So, um, again, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a new tool. Yeah. Um, we're trying to figure out. We don't want to overuse it, but certainly this is probably, like we said, this will be our primary way um, because it, it reaches to everybody if you just have a landline you'll get a message if you only prefer email you'll get a message if you want a text email phone call you can get them all and then it'll also show up on Facebook so awesome. there'll also eventually be a banner on if it's not already on our front page there'll be a banner that will have the last several um, messages on there so if somebody just said is there? I, I, was there a message that I missed something? They can go on there and they can see, oh yeah, there was one earlier today or yesterday. I was looking, <coughs> I was looking at the town website this afternoon. Is, is there a link on the town website to go sign up to, uh, for Code Red? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yep. I'm, I'm yeah, There's a button right down on the front page on the bottom, I thought. Yep. It, it's... Oh, we didn't tell you? <laughs> Thank you, Chief. Thanks, Chief. Thanks, Chief. <laughs> Why am I not surprised? I think they're not the people. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Click right on that, and there you go. And as, as you did point out, please do not use these buttons yet. Um, they're not working properly. We've had nothing but trouble, so there you go. Um, okay, thank you. So, so the issue that uh, has been coming up, I've seen at the front of stores in Abington, there is looks like there's homeless people out there um, camping out. And to me, that is a huge health issue. Um, so mm. I, I don't know if the health agent or the Board of Health has gotten involved yet, but I would like them to get involved um, tomorrow. It's start getting, I mean, this is a, not only is it a health issue, I mean, these people need help, so get them some help, but it's a health issue, it's mm -hmm. sanitary. This is impacting residents, impacting businesses, um, anything. I mean, is this is it trespassing? Do they need to be moved on? There's a lot of issues here. That would be here. up to the property owner, and but we would but, definitely look into it But that's what I'm saying is, now. you know, we need to do something about it because, um, I mean, I drove past it tonight and there's, there's bags of trash out there, there's bottles, there's mm -hmm. coolers. I mean, is they're just everywhere. I mean, uh, we we need to work on this. So, I mean, what is the health agent or the Board of Health, have they done anything yet? I don't know. I'll check with them. Could you direct them to sure. look into this tomorrow? And uh, something else, Scott, that's come up. Um, business, Townwide business hours, is that a selectman thing? Is that a town charter bylaw thing? Townwide business hours. Like, I would have to say I'll, I'll have to look, but my guess is it's in the bylaw in general. However, it's probably, depending on what kind of license they have, you have the ability to regulate it right. when they come in for yeah, that yeah. specific license, like a common BIC license mm -hmm. or 
Um, and it may be a Board of Health thing if it's a food lab, right? right. Yeah. Okay. But I know, like, through if they have a special permit, the um, zoning board may be able to set an hour. But um, if it's you know something more specific, I think you could certainly make recommendations. Okay. You could just find out hmm? the definitive on all businesses in general, or um, more so the 24-hour ones. The, the interest is to basically, some people are interested in having the stores closed at 11, you know, do whatever. Like so all stores, stores, yeah. Everything, just gas, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, whatever. We could definitely look at the hours down the road, but not having 24 hour. Might as well, the pipes are closed. What are the pipes? Yeah, what else are they going to do? Go to the bridge, I guess. We didn't close the bridge. <coughs> we did. No, we did. It's part of the park. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I'll put well, them let me catch you out there. <laughs> Listen, I can't wait to see the gate go up. Oh, look, we have executive session on the list. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Is there anything else? Yep. Could I have a motion to enter into executive session and not to reconvene? I'll make, I'll make a motion that we enter into executive session and not reconvene. Second. Second. Alex. Aye. Aye. Tim. Yep. Aye. Aye. All right, Paul. That's it. Good night, folks.